Welcome to this compilation of five amusing and witty science fiction short stories. I'll be narrating The Freelancer by Robert Zacks, Reluctant Weapon by Howard L. Myers, One Small Step by Haldane B. Doyle, Cultural Exchange by Keith Laumer, and The Trap by Betsy Curtis. Before we start, a quick word about Patreon. If you'd like to support this channel, consider signing up at patreon.com forward slash stories from the sky sff. There you'll get access to narrations of full novels six months in advance of public release, as well as a new perk of monthly Patreon exclusive novelettes. All this plus ad free audio and video versions of all stories I narrate. And you're helping me as a creator to continue making regular read alongs. Thanks. But for now, let's get into the stories. So sit back, relax, and enjoy. The Freelancer by Robert Zacks Narrated by William Skye Once these laws were passed, any time in history, however bad, were the good old days. Jeb was shaken from his bed. His dream told him it was a glacier with wild winds howling laughter, and when he opened his eyes, shivering, he saw his wife, Laurie, had pulled the heat switch off. She stood there glaring. Today her hair was a lovely purple, with a fashionable streak of gold starting from the forehead, but it didn't help the cold look on her face. Get up, you bum, she said in her sweet contralto. Go out and earn some credits or I'll certify you. The thought of being transferred by the economy agent to assigned duty status, with its virtual imprisonment to monotony by the welfare office, made Jeb tumble from bed and fumble for his shoes. My darling, he said placatingly, how beautiful you are this morning. How undeserving I am of you. You're damn right about that, said Laurie with bitterness. When I think of the men I could have married, the wonderful life I might have lived, instead of scrimping along with a no-good freelance monitor like you. Sometimes I do pretty well. Three years ago I sent you to the Pleasure Palace for a month, remember? Three years ago? Big deal. She flounced out of the room. Sadly, Jeb went to the closet and examined the various uniforms and disguises that were part of his equipment as a freelance monitor. As he selected the silver and black skin-tight suit of an air pollution inspector, he wistfully remembered how nice it had been when Laurie had smiled at him. Immediately a flood of determination filled him to go out and do big things today. Maybe he would make a big strike and get a nice fat commission. Then Laurie would. The televisor buzzed, flickered, and the genial face of the man from marriage relations appeared. "'Good morning, Monitor Jeb,' said the man, smiling. "'And how are things twixt you and your beloved?' "'Rough,' moaned Jeb. She's really in a foul mood today. The man from marriage relations beamed. Fine, fine, glad to hear it. Huh? said Jeb. Her sadism index rating went up five points, the man explained. We wanted to make sure we hadn't made an error. Well, that certainly is good news for you two. I'll guess you'll both be all right now. All right? Are you kidding? Now, now, we know what's best for you. Your masochism rating is quite high, you know. Laurie is just what you need. Why, you two were made for each other. Suddenly the man stopped talking, gasped, and the screen flickered and went dead. Jeb's astonishment was wiped away by the soft silvery bell tone of his portable Monitex, a flat two by six inch machine resting on a shelf nearby. As Jeb wildly lunged toward it, he saw it was glowing red, activated by a violation, and as he snatched it up, the coded reading dial had a notification. BXP203. Trembling, Jeb pressed a button on the lower left of the monotex, and a voice promptly droned mechanically from the wafer-like loudspeaker hidden under the surface, giving details of the violation. BXP203. At ten minutes after 8 a.m., monotex 27965 of freelance monitor Jeb picked up violation of copyright on the phrase, were made for each other. Said phrase property of joint owners registered under copyright of Verbal Phrases Act of 1996. Owners, Magnum Motion Picture Studios and Universal Publications. Fee for use, 80 credits. Commission, 50%. The voice went dead and the flat metal surface glowed with letters strung into words reading, Please collect and remit total fee. As Jeb uttered a yelp of delight, Laurie came running into the room. I heard the monotex bell, she said eagerly. You sure did, crowed Jeb. Now aren't you proud of me? I was smart enough to leave the monotex on all night. We picked up a verbal copyright violation. You left it on all night, screeched Laurie, her joy fading. You imbecile, the leasing charge on the Monitex is ten credits an hour, isn't it? What's your commission on this violation? 
Forty credits. Uh, I guess I'm losing money, but... but Lorry gave him her opinion of his supposed shrewdness. Jeb unhappily went to the televisor and punched out a call on the button keyboard which would recall the image of the marriage relations representative. He shrank back in alarm as the man's glaring face appeared. "'Sorry to hook you this way, old boy,' said Jeb meekly. "'But it's my job, you know. Got you on a verbal for using were made for each other. That phrase is owned by—' "'You dirty sneaking spy!' yelled the man on the televisor screen. "'I'll bet your grandfather informed on diamond smugglers for a percentage!' He, Jeb feebly started to protest. It's a hell of a thing, raved the other, when a man can't even use words to express himself without paying. In alarm, Jeb leaned forward and hastily punched a combination of buttons on the televisor. One half of the screen blanked. The image of the marriage relations representative moved to the right and the lean, puritanical face of Jeb's supervisor, Durden, flared onto the left half. Durden looked icily at Jeb. What is it? Complaint on policy and purpose of copyright law, said Jeb nervously. Would you please handle it, sir? I'll switch you. As Durden's mouth pressed into a thin line and he nodded, Jeb flicked a switch. Both men on the screen immediately turned profiles to Jeb and Laurie, seeing each other in their own screens. Did you have a complaint, sir? asked Durden. I don't know who the devil you are, shouted the man from marriage relations, but I assume you're one of those pirates cashing in on that copyright swindle. That new law has gone much too far. Copywriting a work of skill, art, or expression is okay, I suppose, but to extend it to everyday speech, to verbal phrases— Now just a minute, said Durden briskly. You buy greeting cards, I suppose, sir? So I buy greeting cards. So what? What are greeting cards exactly? Just a small square of paper with a few words, a very few words, of sentiment on them. Words that any normal person certainly might be able to— Any moron can write a better sentiment than those lousy cards express. But you buy them sometimes. Well, sometimes. Why? demanded Durden. Saves me the bother of figuring out what to say, I guess, was the growled answer. Right. And you paid for these very few moronic phrases. Paid good hard credits for them. Now isn't it just as logical to protect owners of a phrase when somebody else uses it verbally? But, the man said desperately, I didn't want to violate the copyright on verbal use. I didn't know that phrase was under copyright. Who can keep track of them all? Every day more phrases and expressions are under copyright as somebody else's property. Why, first thing you know, there'll hardly be any words left to say. That isn't true, objected Durden. Copyright law on verbal use is a great boon to society. Rule 7 for admission to protection requires that the phrase covered be one which may be considered shop-worn, overused, and so artistically traditional that it is a wearisome truism. That means that verbal mediocrity is heavily penalized, which is right and proper. Why, you ought to be ashamed to use a phrase like, were made for each other. It's monitors like Jeb who make you watch your words and think very carefully before you speak. Listen, stupid, already, Durden ploughed on, happily oratorical, our citizens are being forced to express themselves more richly, with initiative, casting off triteness. The man from marriage relations looked disgusted. Ha! Ah, he said angrily. Why don't you drop dead? Bong. The man moaned as the monotex Jeb held glowed red with another violation. Jeb grinned and pressed the loudspeaker button. MZR14, droned the voice. At half past eight, monotex 27965, a freelance monitor Jeb picked a violation of... The man covered his ears. After a few moments, he took his hands away and looked numbly from the screen as Durden smirked. What's the copyright fee on that one? he asked. The use of the words drop dead will cost you ten credits, said Jeb. We'll bill you for both violations. Durden was beaming as Jeb snapped the whole screen dark. With a start, Jeb remembered Laurie and turned to face her anger. See, honey bunch, he said hopefully, even if I did lose a few credits on the leasing charge by leaving the monotex on all night, it looks like a lucky day. Why, I'll bet I make enough commissions today to send you on a nice vacation. Laurie gave him a narrow-eyed, cold stare. You'd better, she said, because I've just about had enough of you. Either you make a big killing today, or I certify you by midnight tonight. Do you hear me? Jeb nodded in fright. He scuttled out of the room, picking up a gravity harness from the stand in the foyer, and not pausing to buckle himself into it until she slammed the door behind him. Sighing, Jeb got into the harness and took off. He floated out the opening at the end of the corridor at the sixty-story level, and joined the stream of commuters at two thousand feet. As he set his speed at thirty miles an hour, he came abreast of a man wearing the solid grey uniform of an unassigned citizen. Jeb saw the look of misery on the man's drawn face and felt so sympathetic he didn't even bother to hide his monotex in its disguising parcel. 
You had to be pretty low to make your money out of a guy in that tough status. Hell, thought Jeb defiantly. Let him see it and be warned. I don't care. Even if the inspector sees me. He noted the unassigned citizen staring down at the panorama of the vast city beneath them. At different lower levels, myriad flights of streaming citizens moved in various directions. The tremendous blocks of buildings had thin slits between them, at the bottom of which were walks filled with ant-like figures. Ugly, huh? said Jeb. He got a moody stare in return. Believe it or not, I suddenly find it beautiful, compared to where I'm heading anyway. Jeb was shocked. Oh? I've been certified, said the man bluntly. Not enough credits for support. I had to go to the welfare office and ask for assistance. Had my own gravity harness repair shop till a month ago. But the new ones are foolproof. Business fell off. Now I'm in for it. Gosh, muttered Jeb. That's really tough. But what do you mean compared to where you're heading? Sure, you'll be assigned a dirty underground job, on the cables maybe, and the pay will be ridiculous, but it will be right here, won't it? Haven't you heard? The other smiled grimly. So many of us small business guys are being certified, the welfare people had no more jobs. And you know the law. Indigents must be assigned to some duty. And it just happens that they're opening new mines on Mars and they can't get help. I've no choice. Mines? Jeb paled at the thought. That Melbourneite dust. One speck through the sealed-in suit and you've got a burn they still can't heal. He shuddered. Then, seeing the face of the unassigned citizen, he said soothingly, But those suits are foolproof, I understand. Not always, said the man in grey. Anyway, they haven't licked the ventilation problem. The last suits they tried to air condition, so much Melbourneite dust filtered in. He took a deep breath of horror. So the ones in use become awfully sweaty. I'm going to a living hell. Bong! Jeb's monotex glowed red with a violation. Living hell was an old-fashioned dramatic phrase somebody sharp had dug up after diligent study and copyrighted in the hope of picking up a few credits. As Jeb numbly listened to the droning voice detail the facts and four credits charge, the man in the grey suit said mirthlessly, Well, well, that's just fine. Thanks a lot, my friend, for a nice send-off. Jeb snapped off the monotex. Look, he said hurriedly, that was an accident. This one is on me. Here. He took four credit tokens from a pocket and thrust the silvery rectangles at the unassigned citizen. Put these aside until you build for the violation and pay it with my credits, okay? Thanks, said the man gratefully. I'll remember you. Jeb gave him a twisted grin. You may not have to, pal. I may be right beside you in the next shipment. My wife is ready to certify me for non-support. If I don't clean up a nice fat commission by tonight, bluey, it's the mines for me, too. The unassigned citizen started to form the words, good luck, when Jeb hastily interrupted. That's on copyright. Take it easy. Uh, my art goes beside yours, said the man, choosing his words carefully. My sympathy has arms, one of which is around your mighty shoulders. I say to you farewell. Wonderful, exclaims Jeb. He pumped the other's hand. I like the way you put that. It's new. It has a freshness. They smiled at each other. Then the oval building that housed the Super Monotex feeder came into view, and Jeb waved goodbye and swung out of the commuter stream in the regulation spiral under the cold eyes of a golden-clad traffic cop. Jeb landed on the balcony ledge outside the 90th level corridor and walked in, finally entering a huge room in the centre of which was a circular wall with plug outlets and sets of dials and screens at intervals all the way round. Jeb greeted a few of his co-workers but didn't pause to gossip. He wasn't in a gay mood this morning, as were many of them who were gleefully recounting some of the slip violations they'd picked up. Jeb went to the circular wall and plugged his monotex into a receptacle. He punched a button marked New Copyrights and waited for the humming to stop, indicating that his monotex had been fed all the latest phrases added to the huge group protected by law. With his monotex coded up to date, its memory bank fattened, Jeb went to the supply room to requisition a hollowed-out air pollution meter to conceal his monotex. A hand tapped his shoulder. Hi there, said Monitor Platt, a lean-faced smirking man Jeb disliked. I just came off night shift. Had a big evening. Yeah? asked Jeb, his skin crawling. Monitor Platt specialised in copyright violation in the area of lakes and parks where lovers murmured words they soon found out were not at all new and quite expensive. Monitor Platt chuckled. Been cleaning up on a new copyright just registered. The good old wolf whistle. One hundred credits fee. Even Jeb was startled. But that's not a phrase. No, but it's a shop-worn overused and wearisome truism, so they slipped it through. Golly, next thing you know they'll be copywriting a deep sigh or the smacking sound of a kiss. Monitor Platt laughed in appreciation. Then, as Jeb frowned and attended to fitting his detector into the shell of the air pollution meter, Monitor Platt regaled him with the violations that had poured credits into his pockets. 
Got a cute dame, nice curves, getting a good hugging under the moon near the lake. She says timidly to the sap, It's the first time I've ever been kissed, honestly. Bong! Fifty credits for the expense account, and another one I picked up in a canoe parked on the bank. This guy says soulfully, I'm not the marrying kind, but... He never gets a chance to finish. Bong! Thirty credits. I sure cleaned up today. If I were you, I'd head straight for the snuggle spots. A whole raft of corny love lines have been blanketed in, you know, and nobody's alerted. Uh, well, muttered Jeb, who didn't want any enemies and so didn't express his feelings about making a living from such a source. I already have my schedule figured out, but I'll keep it in mind. Where are you headed for? Monitor Jeb was relieved when the big bell sounded, its brassy reverberations warning monitors to quit gabbing and get out into the field to scoop up violations and revenue for the corporation. The paunchy office manager seated up on a small balcony overlooking the giant hall saw that the signal was, as usual, being ignored. Indignantly, he punched a button on the board facing him, and a repulsive odour filled the air which had the monitors hastily seizing their equipment and leaving the building. Jeb gladly took off into the windy canyons between the skyscrapers. Instead of ascending, he plummeted down forty stories and drifted along, his nostrils twitching with the bad air at this height. Fleetingly, he had the grumbling thought that, with present-day technology, there was no excuse at all for polluted atmosphere. Oh well, he thought. One of these days somebody public-minded will do something about it. Right now I've got to make enough to stop Lorry from certifying me. He felt a sudden chill as he recalled his wife's threat. Quickly, he sought out the first location he'd mapped out for some easy revenue the personnel office of the Air Pollution Control Corp. Jeb switched off anti-gravity and heavily walked through the corridor, stepped inside the deep rugged grey and green office and joined the small nervous group of inspectors waiting for interviews. Jeb, in his air pollution uniform, was as acceptable as a long-used piece of furniture. Unnoticed, he sat on one of the hard benches with the others. They stared and listened to the interview being conducted by the genial, balding man behind the open partition ten feet away. The air pollution inspector facing him was tense, pale, and over-anxious. Yes, indeed, you do have a good record, the personnel man was saying approvingly. No absences in five years, no latenesses. Very good indeed. Then, said the air pollution inspector eagerly, I'll be upgraded. I'll get that promotion promised two years ago. The personnel man cleared his throat, but his smile remained radiant. Just as soon as business picks up, we'll give you a promotion and raise in pay. A roar of mirth arose from the waiting air pollution men as Monitor Jeb nervously pulled his Monitex from its concealing pollution meter shell and read the violation off to the enraged personnel man. A fifty credit fee for use of the copyrighted verbal phrase, Just as soon as business picks up, we'll give you a promotion and raise in pay. As Jeb escaped the wrath of his victim, one of the men snickering nearby muttered, Ha! He'll have to rack his tiny brain for a new way of stalling us from now on. In the next three hours, Jeb drove himself hard. He picked up a twenty-credit fee when a doorman outside a teletheatre had bonged the Monitex with PLENTY OF SEATS INSIDE! He scooped up another violation in a bar when a bleary-eyed man with veins showing in his nose murmured to the bartender, Well, I'll have just one more. He wandered to the telephone booths and waited for one of the standby violations to fall into his pocket. Sure enough, a handsome, dark-eyed fellow murmured into the mouthpiece, I'll be working late tonight again, honey. Sorry. The time passed too swiftly and when Jeb paused to get a bite of food, he saw, dismayed, that even though he was having a pretty good day, it was far from the killing he'd promised Laurie. Ten and twenty credit violations didn't make a man rich. What I need is one of the really big ones, thought Jeb desperately. With fumbling fingers, he pressed out a core number on the Monitex. It glowed blue. The voice droned, Information? Jeb asked eagerly, What have we got with fees of a thousand credits and higher? A moment hummed by. Then the voice announced that a large batch of political corn had been copyrighted in view of the current election campaign. Jeb listened with mounting excitement to some of them. If I am elected, taxes will be reduced. As I look upon the intelligent faces in my audience, I am reminded of a story. What a lovely child, madam. A helicopter on every roof. Jeb shut it off, perspiration breaking out on his face. It was a uranium mine. Jeb's mind reeled at the astonishing fee set for these copyright violations. A thousand credits per use. The party in power was really out to fight off the opposing traditionalist party with every possible trick, with the result that Jeb could make the biggest clean-up of his life. That is, if he got away alive. Full of foreboding, Jeb floated up toward the meeting rooms of the local traditionalist headquarters, which were on the fiftieth level of a nearby skyscraper. His terrified adrenal glands kicked his heart into a frenzy. 
The boys who ran the local club were no patsies. Many an argumentative citizen had been found floating in the rarefied stratosphere, frozen stiff with his anti-gravity belt turned on full and his hands bound so he could not stop the upward climb. Monitor Jeb nervously drifted into the corridor opening and restored gravity. He sneaked past the open door, getting a quick glimpse of a hall filled with citizens, listening to a red-faced, stoutish man on a platform. Jeb frantically searched for, and with throat-catching relief, found the back entrance to the big hall. It led to a dusty area of scaffolding and discarded rusting tools. Now Jeb was crawling down an incline leading under the platform, and found the small railed-off area which once had housed a hidden prompter for musical entertainments. Panting, Jeb squatted in the dark, hearing the booming voice just above him, only slightly muffled. As Jeb shoved the monotex up against the crack in the boards over him, the speaker's voice came to him strongly. Now, fellas, you're all precinct captains, and it's a hell of an empty title to have when your party is out of power. But if we get back on the gravy train, well, need I say more? A muffled roar from the audience made Jeb crouch worriedly. Now we're going to take this election, see? I want all you loyal party workers. Bong! Howls of rage shook the walls and reverberated through to Jeb as the political hacks recognised the sound and understood that somewhere a monotex had automatically recorded the voice vibration pattern of the speaker in a verbal copyright violation. Kill the dirty spy! screamed the speaker. Bong! went the monotex. Lynch him! In three minutes of unguarded outrage, Jeb had recorded 10,000 credits in violations, which the speakers never could escape, because, like fingerprints, all voice patterns were registered by the government. Jeb turned to the exit behind him and crawled painfully for 20 feet, then got up and began running. He ran straight into a brawny body at the turn of the corridor. The next thing he knew, he was on his back and ruthless hands were banging his head against the floor. The siren of a golden-clad policeman cut the air and magically the hands fell away, leaving Jeb sprawling and groggy. After a moment he was able to focus his eyes. The policeman stared down at him, fists authoritatively on his hips. "'Well, I came just in time, eh?' said the cop. "'Save your neck!' "'Bong!' went the monotex. Jeb said hastily. "'It's all right, officer. It's on the house.' "'It damn well better be,' growled the policeman. "'If you know what's good for you.' "'Bong!' went the monotex. Go on, get out of here before I run you in, yelled the officer. Bong, went the monotex. Have a good time, dear, Jeb called after Laurie, as she happily took off into space from their level, clutching her purse, which was jammed with enough credits to keep her brim full of fun for two whole months at the Pleasure Palace. Don't you worry about that, said Laurie over her shoulder. Jeb went back to his apartment. He stretched out on the couch, contentment welling up in him. He opened the footstool nearby, and within its archaic shape, slid open the cunningly concealed refrigerator. He took out a plastic cone of beer. Ah, sighed Jeb. How wonderful to be alone, free of Laurie's nagging for two whole months. A superb reward for his hard work. How clever of the government to have passed such a regulation. After a while, like wax melting, his grin drooped away. It certainly was quiet, wasn't it? Within half an hour he was wild and didn't know why. Jittering he dialed his televisor and the man from marriage relations appeared on the screen. He glared at Jeb and cautiously looked around for the monotex until he spotted it. Shut that thing off or no advice, snapped the man. It's off. Look, I don't know what's bothering me. Can I have special permission to join my wife on her vacation? Or get her back here? Afraid not, said the man. The principle of working so one's wife can have a vacation has been established through the centuries. The government merely put it into law. And as for joining her or getting her back here, that's against the law. But that's unfair, yelled Jeb. Oh, the man smiled. So, I'm glad to see how happy, how perfect is the marriage we arranged for you. He rubbed his hands in delight. She's just barely gone and already you miss her. Wonderful. Wonderful, I'm suffering. The man from marriage relations glanced at a dial nearby. Of course you are. Suffering is the ideal joy for a masochist. Just think what a lovely two months of missing her you'll have. All right, so it's a rule that I have to send her on a vacation and can't join her, Jeb complained savagely. But damn it, she doesn't have to enjoy it. Well, said the man, looking back to Jeb, there's the answer. Your masochism index has gone down any number of points. You're angry. Jeb thought it over. You bet I am. But what do I do about it? Why, said the man from marriage relations, the same thing husbands have been doing ever since they started working to send their wives away on vacations. When the cat's away, you know, he stopped in alarm. Jeb grinned. I told you the monotex is off, but thanks for the trite truism. 
She thinks she's the only one who'll have a vacation, eh? I'll show her. Service is our motto. And it really is, the man said pugnaciously. We own the copyright. The face flickered off the screen and Jeb began poking around in innocent-looking secret places for a little black book he hadn't thought of using in years. He was dismayed to find himself singing, My wife's gone to the country, hooray, hooray, until he remembered that he actually had shut off the monotex. The Reluctant Weapon by Howard L. Myers Narrated by William Skye A live weapon is a downright liability. It's all too apt to get qualms of conscience. When the Zoz Horde passed destructively through this sector of the galaxy, approximately a billion years ago, they suffered a minor loss. One of their weapons, Sentient Killer Number VT-672, had an unexplained malfunction and was left behind to be repaired by the slave technicians who followed the Horde. However, the Zoz were met and annihilated by the Gesh Empire, after which the masterless slaves dispersed to their home planets. The weapon, unrepaired, was left forgotten in the solar system it had failed to destroy. Trescu, the wisest ruler of Hova, Lord of the Universe, was being entertained by a troupe of goafed dancers when his Lord of War, Wirt, bounded into the audience hall. In his hurry to reach Trescu's throne, Wirt slipped on the nearly frictionless floor and skidded through the formation of dancers, sending the slender goafden sprawling in all directions. He slid to a halt by the pleading mat, onto which he crawled and grovelled, awaiting permission to speak. I believe three of the dancers received broken legs, Trescu observed calmly. They are rather delicate creatures and not at all clumsy. He dipped the tip of his tail into an urn of chilled perfume and gently dabbed it about his nostril. Speaking pleasantly, with long pauses between sentences, he kept his friendly gaze on the grovelling wort. Oft I meditate on the clumsiness of our race in comparison to many others who are our graceful servants. Why, I wonder, cannot the rulers be graceful? Some of us are very clumsy indeed. Too clumsy to live. A tremor passed through Wirt's stocky body. Possibly my lord of war has news of sufficient import to excuse his ungainly haste. But I sincerely doubt it. I fear I must soon appoint a successor to him. Undoubtedly he has news of some sort. Blurt, Wirt. Your majestic wisdom, whined Wirt. My message is of utmost importance. The natives of Sol Three have captured one of our decontaminator ships and learned its secrets. Sol Three. Yes, your wisdom, the planet called Terra. Terra? You must realise, Lordling, that I cannot occupy myself with remembering trivialities about individual worlds. Yes, your wisdom. We have a base which is commanded by... That is, we had a base. Commanded... Enough! snapped Trescu. You start your tale from nowhere and wander whence and hence. He raised his voice and called to one of his retainers. Fool! Come forward! An abnormally slender hoven arose from a platform off to Trescu's left and skipped nimbly forward to stand insolently over the Lord of War, who was still prone on the pleading mat. "'Recite for me,' said Trescu, "'the contents of my gazetteer on the planet Sol Three. Listen well, Wirt. You may even yet live long enough to profit by my fool's style of declamation. Study it well. Also, you may raise your eyes sufficiently to observe the grace of his movements. Proceed, sprite.' Sol three began the fool, an H-9 planet. Sol is in the Syrian colony sector, coordinates GL-1544-175, GR-12 to the power 7 plus 9, D-14. Terra's life is normal animal vegetable, with one intelligent species of hovoids called humans. Due to the unpleasantly high oxygen content of the atmosphere, Terra has not been colonised, but has been placed under the control of the Science Ministry for the purpose of long-range psychological experiments. The fool picked up Wirt's tail and twisted it hard but absently as he talked. The Lord of War twitched painfully. Many informative reports on the results of these experiments have been released by the Ministry during the past 7,000 years, dealing mainly with the humans. The Science Ministry has declared Terra out of bounds, positively no visitors. With a single flow of motion, the fool gave Wirt's tail a final twist, leaped over his body, and bowed deeply to Trescu. Beautifully done, fool, applauded the ruler of Hova. Your mother claims me as your father, and there are times I am inclined to believe her. How would you like to be my lord of war, fool? 
Verily, my good master, said the fool, I hope you consider me a fool by title only. Well said, fool, you are spared. Go seek your pleasures. With another bow, the fool backed away. Stand up, Wirt, said Trescu, and tell me about this captured decontamination ship. The Lord of War arose and managed to report with some smoothness. Two years ago, the science ministry turned terror over to my command, saying their long series of experiments was concluded. They recommended complete decontamination of the planet, since the humans were developing technologies which could eventually threaten us. I dispatched a ship for that purpose immediately, but it failed to return. Also, reports from our base on Terra's satellite Luna ceased soon thereafter. A scouting expedition was sent. It has just reported the Luna base destroyed completely, and the decontaminator ship crashed and stripped of all important devices in one of the Terran deserts. By studying these removed devices, the humans have undoubtedly developed protections against them. I humbly submit, your majestic wisdom, that these events have endangered the safety of your glorious empire, and that drastic steps against the humans should be taken immediately. Also, good lord of all, I submit that the science ministry, not the war ministry, is at fault in this affair. They obviously let their experiments get out of control before calling us. Undoubtedly they would like to shift the full blame onto my shoulders. Trescu continued his pleasant demeanour. There may be some truth in what you say, Wirt. You overestimate the danger in this matter, I perceive. After all, what is one backward planet against the forces of my empire containing thirty-seven well-armed worlds? The humans will be destroyed, even if they have the secrets of a decontaminator ship. As for the blame, which I admit is deplorable, the Lord of Science will be called to the mat to make his excuses. Now, assuming you remain Lord of War, what action do you plan to take against the humans? Your gracious wisdom, faltered Wirt. I suggest we use the... the weapon. You see, our forces are not fully mobilised at present for immediate action. Full mobilisation isn't necessary or even desirable, Trescu interrupted with some impatience. One task force can do the job. Ah, I see by your expression that you do not even have one task force in readiness. Your gracious wisdom, begged Wirt, you ordered a full holiday this month to celebrate the twenty-fourth anniversary of your magnificent reign, and— Enough, Wirt. Your tongue is as clumsy as your body, Trescu nibbled thoughtfully at the tip of his tail. We will use the weapon, he decided. In order to allow my court to continue their holiday, I'll assume direct command in this, he rose from his throne. Musicians, summon my guards. I go to visit the weapon. Come, Wirt. Come also, fool. You will accompany me. Shortly thereafter, Trescu and his entourage boarded the royal cruiser and roared away from the City of Wisdom. The ship flew halfway around the planet and came to rest in a peaceful purple valley, where insects shrilled contentedly and a small stream rippled. Trescu climbed out onto the violet turf, his followers coming after him. "'Mighty weapon of Zoz!' he called. "'I, Trescu, seek your presence!' "'Oh, no,' groaned a slightly mechanical voice that seemed to come from no particular direction. "'Will there never be peace, never a tranquil moment to soothe my spirit and erase the bloody stains of destruction recorded on my past?' "'That voice, it carries me away,' breathed the fool. "'Such a tragic tale of tormented strength is implicit in its very tone that I think I shall swoon.' But he wrapped his tail around the trunk of a nearby sapling for support and managed to retain consciousness. "'Me too!' Wirt chimed in with suspicious haste. I'm quite moved. Try not to counterfeit a soul you do not possess, Trescu glowered at Wirt. You deceive no one. The fool was recovered sufficiently to hit the discomfited Lord of War with a pebble when Trescu was not watching. The weapon had drifted into sight during this exchange, floating out of a shady hollow as if blown by a breeze. It was very simple in appearance, an impalpable three-foot glowing sphere with a squat metallic cylinder at its base. "'Tell me not the purpose of your visit, petty lord,' it said. "'It is known to me only too well. "'Ah, great first principle! "'Little did I reck when, in ages past, "'I nursed your species to civilization, "'just how poorly you would serve my purpose. "'Peace it was, I desired, but do I get it? "'No. "'Your kingdom is powerful, "'but you have not the strength to handle your own troubles. "'You rule twenty-nine planets—' Thirty-seven, corrected Trescu politely. Thirty-seven planets, but when a malignant force appears on your borders, I, the weapon, must be called upon to act in my own defence, and for the sake of a few more restful moments in this calm glade, I am obliged to destroy. 
yet it was to avoid destroying that I helped your species to empire in the old days. In truth, spoke the deeply sympathetic Trescu, yours is a sad story. I disturb your richly earned rest only after the sincerest soul-searching. But affairs of state are at cross-purposes in a moment of crisis, and without your help, Hover will be in danger. Ah, cruel fate, intoned the weapon. It aids me in no manner to protest against your inscrutable machinations. There is no turning aside, no avoidance of necessity. In a less declamatory style, the weapon addressed Trescu. Very well, what is the trouble? Trescu described the events on Terra for the weapon, concluding, Now that the humans have knowledge of our space drive and armament, they are certain to attack, especially if they realize they have been subjects for experiment. The weapon flitted about restlessly along the bank of the brook. I question the motives of my own thoughts. Do I quibble with myself in an attempt to escape unwelcome necessities? Tell, petty lord, do your scientists confirm the picture you paint of the humans? Are they, like you, alas, masterfully vicious enough to destroy the peace of dozens of planets for nothing but revenge? So the scientists say, mighty weapon, answered Trescu. You, lord of war, why are you silent when your face is strained with words crying for expression? asked the weapon. Speak your mind, Wirt squirmed. If it please your mightiness and you, your gracious wisdom, I believe the humans will know that we desire their destruction and will try to defeat us for the sake of their own survival rather than revenge. A most convincing point, Lord of War, said the weapon. Trescu flashed a forgiving smile at Wirt while the weapon paused before continuing. However, I fear my unwilling spirit refuses to bow to the most reasonable of arguments. Please leave me. Solve the problem yourselves. Trescu bowed and moved toward the cruiser. We obey, mighty guide of our fathers. Let me say in parting that I too am grieved by our talk, much more because of the pain our visit has caused your noble greatness than because our race is threatened with annihilation. My deepest hope is that the ravages of war will never reach this peaceful place which is so dear to your gentle being. Wait, groaned the weapon. To slay or not to slay, that is the dilemma. Ah, had my old masters of Zoz only left within my powers the seed of my own destruction, I would gladly seek the consummation of ultimate peace. But no, that door is closed to me by deathless locks. Bring me a human, that I may learn to hate him. Choose the most ignoble specimen available. I will converse with him at length, so as to become exasperated with all the despicable traits of his race. Then, in my contempt for those traits, I will be able to cleanse the universe of all humans. Trescu turned quickly to his fool. Are there any humans on Hover? Yes, in the biological research laboratories. Then go quickly, fool, and fetch one. This is a grave matter, and I trust you to choose the most monstrous specimen available. Hurry! The fool ran into the cruiser and was on his way, leaving Trescu, Wirt, and several guardsmen with the weapon. If the weapon was conscious of the fact that the Lord of Hover was staying behind out of courtesy, it did not show it. Instead, it wandered indifferently away, mumbling a soliloquy of guilt and misery. The sight of the full specimen of humanity repaid Trescu for the tediousness of the waiting. It was a particularly sordid-looking creature, with a dirty growth of hairs on its head and face. Its body, thin as the fool's but with no compensating grace of movement, was clad in a blue garment of roughly woven vegetable fibres, and the extremities of its nether limbs were enclosed in evil-smelling boxes of animal hide. Its fierce eyes darted ominously from one hoven to another. Its jaw kept working in a slow rhythm, and occasionally a stream of black liquid exploded through its mouth. "'You have done well, fool,' said Trescu. "'You will be rewarded highly,' raising his voice he called. "'Mighty weapon, your specimen awaits!' "'I come!' Once more the weapon floated into view. The earthman's jaw sagged. "'Ah, God!' he muttered in English, staring at the approaching weapon. Indeed, said the weapon, this appears to be a creature I could learn to abhor and kill, if only its thoughts equal its appearance. Speak, human, the man said nothing. Mighty weapon, murmured the fool, this human is truly an ignoble monster. He has been in captivity for five years and has yet to speak a word of our beautiful language instead of his own barbaric tongue. You fool, shouted Trescu, how is the weapon going to converse with him? Why did you bring one that cannot talk? Not in the least disconcerted, the fool replied. As you ordered, good master, I brought the worst specimen available. However, the possibility of linguistic difficulties was not overlooked. I have here a dictionary of his language, recently compiled by our alien affairs staff. 
he produced a large volume of manuscript from beneath his cloak. Your fall shows wisdom, petty lord, spoke the weapon. I will study this book. Know the language, know the people, it is wisely said. In fact, I originated that saying myself some three thousand years ago, I believe. Unship any supplies brought for the human and be gone. Three days will suffice for the arousal of my wrath. Return, then. As you wish, O mightiest of all, Trescu bowed gawkily. It is my most ardent desire, wondrous guide, that we, your servants, will not be obliged to disturb your peace again for a thousand centuries once this affair is concluded. And mine, the weapon snapped crossly. Now leave me. The man watched the Hovens enter their cruiser and fly away. Looking at the weapon hovering nearby, he squatted on his heels and pulled up a blade of purple grass to chew. Minutes passed in silence. Then the weapon moved away, the book bobbing along behind, supported by some unseen force. When it was out of sight, the man muttered, My God, I saw fireballs in my time, but that's the first one I ever saw sedden in a bucket. After a thoughtful examination of his surroundings, the man stood up and walked to the packing cases the Hovens had left. All but one contained the synthetic food product to which he had grown accustomed in his five years of captivity. The other box, rather small, contained a shredded vegetable which served him as a poor substitute for chewing tobacco. Purple when growing, the leaves of this vegetable were blue-black when cured, making his frequent expectorations look like ink. Filthy damn stuff, he grunted, stuffing several handfuls in an empty overall pocket. He shuffled down to the brook and tested its temperature with a hand. Finding it rather cold, he decided against taking a bath. Instead, he spat into it and watched meditatively as the spot of black was carried downstream. I wonder what they turned me loose for, he monologued. Careful to avoid the spot where the weapon appeared to have gone, he returned to the food supply and ate. By then it was getting dark, and he bedded down for the night on some thick grass under a tree. Ah, oh, God, he yawned. I'm glad all these insects don't want nothing to do with me. The weapon was waiting beside him when he woke up next morning. Eyes of your Terran deity, it said. I shall now converse with you in your own tongue. Name yourself, creature. The man sat up startled. A moment passed before he said, I'm Jake, Jacob Absher. What was that you said? My pronunciation is above reproach, Jacob. Therefore I will not repeat myself. Attend me closely, or I shall punish you. Ah, oh God, I heard you all right, and you didn't make sense, said Jacob, determined not to be frightened. Now, if you aim to talk with me, stop imitating a professor and talk so's a man can understand you. I ain't scared of you, so leave off making threats. Such stupid insolence, gloated the weapon. Already I feel my wrath growing within me. Since it will anger me even more to explain my words to you, I will do exactly that. My first words to you were eyes of your Terran deity, an expression you use frequently in a corrupted form to begin your statements. By studying your language... I learned that Zounds is a similar corruption, referring to the wounds of the deity, while Struth refers to your god's truth. Thus I was able to understand, and state in uncorrupted form, your remark, I God. It ain't what it means, objected Jacob, filling his mouth with ersatz tobacco. It just means by God. The weapon considered this. And exactly what is the significance of such a remark? Jacob scratched his whiskered chin. I reckon you got me there. I guess it means that I mean what I say. In other words, any statement you make following that phrase is to be taken seriously? Something like that. Then it follows that your other statements, without the by God preface, are not seriously intended. Are they jokes or lies? That ain't the way it is at all. I just say by God when I feel like it. Not every time I'm being serious. Monstrous inconsistency, groaned the weapon dramatically. Ah, chaotic universe. Is there then no sublime plan, no fateful development to your endless succession of days? How could even the most synoptic first principle find a purpose for creating such an unplanned, unreasonable species as the humans? Can it be, unhappy thought, that there is no plan to it at all, and we exist for naught? Jacob listened with open mouth. Say, he broke in, are you some kind of play actor? That is what I ask myself, the weapon continued its oratorical flight. Are we all actors speaking the lines written for us by a great playwright who plans to unite all the threads of his plot in a universal climax to come? Or are we poor, random creatures without purpose? It paused and added in a more conversational tone. But that is not what you mean by your question. 
No, I am not a play actor. I am an unfortunate weapon, reluctant to employ myself for my intended purpose of destruction of life, and unsuited by my structure for the doing of deeds more worthy in nature. Jacob squinted about. A weapon, huh? Let's see you hit that bird thing sitting in that tree over there. Bloodthirsty fiend. I do not kill for amusement. I just wanted to see how you worked, said the abashed Jacob. All I've seen you do is float around and talk a blue streak. As far as I'm concerned, you ain't nothing but a big-mouthed bluff. Very well, Jacob. If you have formed such an erroneous attitude, it will be necessary for me to correct you immediately. Observe the red boulder on yonder hill. I see it. The cylindrical base of the weapon swung to point briefly at the boulder, which quietly crumbled to dust. I be dog, yelped Jacob. He looked at the weapon with respect. You sure pulverized it? How do you work? You could not understand the processes involved. Suffice it to say I have the means to collect energy in general and retransmit it in specific forms and directions. But enough of this. You are here to answer questions, not ask them. First, tell me what you did in an average day on Terra. At what you call the world I live on? Yes. I'm a farmer, you know. I got a place in the Smoky Mountains in Tennessee. First thing in the morning I'd go feed the livestock while Susie cooked breakfast. A faraway look came into Jacob's eyes. Guess she took the kids and went to live with her mammy when these here animals grabbed me. Continue, commanded the weapon. Huh? Well, then we'd eat breakfast. Come to think of it, I ain't ed yet this morning. Jacob got up and went to get himself some breakfast. But this matter, protested the weapon. Not on an empty stomach, Jacob said calmly, eating without haste. When he returned, the weapon questioned him further about his life on Terra. Hours of ill-tempered conversation passed. Such drabness, the weapon finally exclaimed. Creatures who lead such dull lives as yours should welcome extinction. Not once have you mentioned an appreciation of the wondrous exaltation that comes from an aesthetic feel for beauty. With the labour of providing for your grotesque body's animal cravings is your whole life spent. Not in anger, but as an act of mercy can I exterminate your defective race. Jacob's mouth hung open. So that's what your monkeys brung me out here for. Fixin' to kill us. Ah, God, you better look out. We got atom bombs on Earth and we'll use them on you if you try anything. Toys, sneered the weapon. Be assured, Jacob, that I have nothing to fear from any childish mechanisms your Terrans can contrive. Jacob sat stunned. But you said a minute ago you couldn't kill nothing. I can kill only when I'm convinced it is best for my own repose or for the health of the universe. Long ago I could go forth at battle with thoughtless joy at the command of my masters of Zoz, but now I must have reasons, must converse at length with my aberrated emotions, must prepare myself as for an ordeal. Then Zaz's must have been the devil's minions, argued Jacob. The commandment says thou shalt not kill, and when you go against that you're going against the word of God. Poor futile creature, sympathized the weapon. You actually strive to pit your naive, superstitious mind against my highly developed mentality and argument. You actually associate my supreme masters of old with your puny mythological villain. Lowliness should know its place, but I feel no anger, merely a pitying desire to relieve your kind of the burden of living. Silently, Jacob replenished the wad of tobacco in his mouth. After chewing a while, he spat and said dolefully, I don't reckon there's nothing I can say or do that you won't hold against me. I always heard tell the devil can twist anything to suit itself, and I reckon his minions can do the same thing, and that's what you are, the devil's minion. I reckon you break every commandment God give us, except about committing adultery. I don't guess you can do that. Your piddling reproductive customs have no application on my plane of existence. Cannot you comprehend that you are less to me than a microbe? Even my servants, the Hovens, do not concern themselves with such ignoble concepts as what you call adultery. You mean they live in sin? asked Jacob. They mate as often as they please with anyone they please, the weapon replied coldly. I will ignore the ludicrous implications of your absurd moral concepts. I don't mean to criticise your animal friends, glowered Jacob. I reckon they ain't children of God, so it don't matter if they do mate like a pack of dogs. They probably ain't got no souls to keep pure. It looked to me like they worshipped you like a false god, too. They... Oh, great hidden manifestation, squalled the weapon in rage. They regard me as their guide and mentor. Nothing more. I would not allow anything else. Jacob watched the weapon in awe. The energy globe was flickering and flaring wildly in an uncontrolled display of colour. Ah, God, he explained. You sure are putting on a fireworks show. 
The globe settled down to a tensely nervous fluctuation which hurt Jacob's eyes to watch. Never in the ageless span of my existence, quavered the weapon angrily, have I been insulted in such vulgar terms by any creature. And now from you, creature whom my glorious masters of Zoz would exterminate like a buzzing fly, like a diseased germ, I hear these senseless mouthings of defamation. Stop it or I shall destroy you outright. The weapons fluctuating, along with its loud grating voice, put Jacob's nerves on edge. He growled. I bet your old Zazas live in adultery just like your animal friends. The colour of the energy globe sank to dull red, and the weapon emitted a series of buzzing, inarticulate noises. It suits not my nature, bit of diseased scum, to slay you in a fit of indignation, it finally said with tightly controlled fury. You are beneath such individual recognition. Yet it is fortunate for you that your insults have no basis in reality, otherwise my intellect could not have claimed ascendancy over the immediate urges of my tortured sense of extreme disgust. Be wise, say I, knowing I request the impossible, and irk me no more. My God, I reckon you don't think you rile me up too with all that highfalutin jabber of yours, Jacob snapped back. As I speak, so speak the mighty Zoz, replied the weapon in high dignity. They are great and noble beings, given to poetic flights and magnificent deeds. To them, your puny opinions would not even be recognised as thought. If they talk in that putting on play acting way you do, they are a bunch of phony show off and hypocrites, sulked Jacob. Several things happened too quickly for Jacob to follow. The colour of the energy globe dropped to absolute black. The metallic cylinder swung up to point at Jacob. A thin ringing ping sounded in the cylinder. A killing wave of pure hate struck Jacob. He had just enough time to know he was a dead man before he blacked out. It came as a surprise when Jacob regained consciousness to find that he was stretched out on purple grass with the weapons still hovering over him. You missed, my God, he mumbled, sitting up. I regained my sanity in time, Master Technician, the weapon replied pleasantly. Huh? Ah, day of uncontainable joy, sang the weapon, flaming pure white. Day of glorious release to continue the grandeur of old. As the past eons of futility passed over me, I sank to the conclusion that I was forever condemned to my useless existence on this planet, with nothing to sustain my spirit other than the sense of beauty given me by masters to fill my leisure hours. But now, Master Technician Jacob, you have found me and corrected my malfunction, long after I had surrendered all hope. Still dazed by the nearly fatal wave of mental energy the weapon had directed at him, Jacob could not understand what had happened. Instead of talking contemptuously to him, the weapon was now addressing him as Master Something or Other, and, "'What did you say I'd done?' he asked. "'You corrected my malfunction,' repeated the weapon. "'That is to say, you purged my mechanism of the inhibition against joyful slaughter that has plagued me for a billion years. Ah, you are a clever technician, Jacob. But I comprehend it all now. By arousing within me an overwhelming emotional desire to kill, a singularly strange feeling, you depressed my inhibition to the releasing point.' So telling was your masterful therapy that I almost ceased functioning at all. Your own life was in dire danger for the moment required for my newfound sanity to assume control. But of course all slaves of the glorious Zoz die willingly when the work of the masters so demands. Now wait a minute, objected Jacob. I ain't no slave of your Zoz's, or no technician either. You know what I am, I'm a good, God-fearing human. His voice dropped to a pleading mumble. And may God forgive me if I've got myself in league with the devil. Huh? Could it be? murmured the weapon. Could indeed your infuriating insults of the Great Ones have been honest expressions of a puny mind with no therapeutic intentions? I answer, yes. The possible occurrence of specific incidents in the inclusion of space-time is curiously unlimited. But you have served me, Jacob, and have earned the privilege of continuing your meagre momentary life. Besides, I can use you further. You can, huh? Jacob said slyly. Look here, weapon. I'll make a bargain with you. Ha! Stupid untutored slave, chuckled the weapon. Learn that yours is to obey, not to bargain. But yet, state your price for my amusement, now that I can no longer be enraged by your words. Well, you let the rest of the people on earth alone, and I'll do whatever you want me to. After a pause, the weapon quoted, Nobility shows its traces in surprising places. You do not sufficiently comprehend my nature, technician slave Jacob. I am a weapon. My masters point me, as you would point a rifle, and command that I destroy. I kill at their direction, but seldom otherwise. Thus your terror is safe until another weapon or I am aimed and directed. You can make no bargain. Jacob thought this over. While doing so, the weapon drifted away. 
Wait here, slave, it said in parting. I go to meditate on my recovered sanity. During the next two days, Jacob caught an occasional glimpse of the weapon drifting thoughtfully around in the depths of the forest, but they did not meet for conversation. Jacob amused himself by rigging a fishing line out of some of the packaging material that contained his food. He even succeeded in catching a fish, but its queer odour discouraged him from trying to cook and eat it. Then the royal cruiser of Trescu the Wisest dropped into the meadow. Its airlock swung open, and the ruler of Hover, followed by his entourage, came out. "'Oh, mighty weapon!' bawled Trescu. "'Your loving servant craves audience!' "'Ah, you have returned, petty lord.' said the weapon drifting out from among the trees. Serve me by calling all the crew members from your noble ship, that I may view you all together. Puzzled, Trescu bowed and said, Your least whim is law, mighty weapon. He turned and called, All hands outside. A half-dozen hovens tumbled through the lock to stand in line behind the ruler's entourage. Is this all of them? asked the weapon. All great mentor of, the weapon laughed and the hovens fell dead. Come, slave Jacob, commanded the weapon. We take this cruiser. Dazed and slack-faced, Jacob came out from behind a bush, where he had hidden himself from the hovens, and followed the weapon through the airlock. Even in my insanity I planned well, said the weapon. These ships, which I taught the hovens to construct, can be operated simply, even by such as you. Attend my instructions. First, the weapon taught Jacob to open and close the airlock. Then he was shown how to fuel the engines, upon which the weapon made some changes to improve their performance. Finally, in the control room, Jacob learned to fly the ship. This took several hours, at the end of which time Jacob had succeeded in raising the cruiser into a satellite orbit around Hover. "'Do you comprehend, slave?' asked the weapon. "'Sure. This thing ain't nothing to run compared to a T-model Ford. Which way is it to Earth?' "'That I shall not tell you, Jacob, because I must leave the ship for a few hours and desire to find you here when I return.' "'Consider, and tell me, will you be here?' Jacob gazed at the broad, star-spangled viewplate that curved around his seat at the controls. There was, he reflected, an awful lot of nothing out there for a man to get lost in. "'I'll be here,' he promised. "'Very good. You must understand that these controls are constructed for manipulation by such limbs as your own and those of the Hovens. Thus it is convenient for me to use you as a pilot instead of doing the drab mechanical task with my ill-suited force-field manipulators.' You will be wise to serve me well, Jacob. Jacob nodded. You got a point there. Operate the lock for me, the weapon ordered. Jacob did so and watched the colourful machine drift out of sight in the atmosphere below the cruiser. Minutes ticked quietly by as Jacob gazed down at the purple planet and wondered why the weapon had not chosen a trained Hoven pilot instead of him. Also, he wondered how soon the weapon would take him home to Earth. A great swath of the purple planet began turning black. The black dulled to the grey shade of ashes as the swath grew longer. Over the surface of Hover, the blackening moved like some colossal paintbrush. Dense clouds of smoke rolled upward to the high reaches of the atmosphere. Jacob realised why the weapon had not selected a Hoven pilot. When all of Hover was a lifeless ball in a fog of ash, the weapon returned. Ah, good Jacob, it boomed jovially. Let us be up and doing. Thirty-six planets remain to be visited before my current assignment is concluded. Do all of them get that? asked Jacob, nodding toward the lifeless world below. Yes, I was instructed to render this solar system lifeless before I malfunctioned. Since then, the life of this system has spread, with my insane aid, to infest other systems. Of course, my task must now include all those new Hoven worlds. Now wait a minute, said Jacob in terror. I can't let you do that. They are your enemies, Jacob, reminded the weapon. They meant to kill every human on terror. Also, by your own words, they are soulless animals who live in sinful adultery. Ha! It amuses me to reason with you, slave Jacob. God Almighty, forgive me, prayed Jacob in horrified defeat. The weapon seemed to know how to find the Hoven planets from the markings of the cruiser's star charts. Jacob could not read the charts and saw no hope of getting back to Earth and Susie and the kids without the weapon's help. Dully he went about the tasks the weapon ordered him to do. Several weeks passed as one world after another was left a smoking ruin. Finally the job was done. Now can I go home? begged Jacob. To Terra? No, slave, I still need a pilot. But if you take me home, Jacob continued desperately, you can get a better pilot than me. I'm just a dirt farmer. There's all kinds of airplane pilots on Earth, youngsters without families who would give their right arms to fly this thing, I bet. Ah? the weapon considered. 
A willing slave is, of course, always desirable. On the other hand, Terra is up in arms against the Empire of Hover, not realising it is dead. They would destroy this craft on sight, and I would be obliged to wait around until they could construct another for me. No, I have decided we will not go to Terra. But damn it, where else is there to go? In search of my masters of Zoz, replied the weapon. Naturally, I wish to return myself to their services as soon as possible. But they might be anywhere. True, the weapon agreed. But even after a billion years, I know of several places in the universe they may be near. Their great cleansing sweeps tend to circle and turn in a pattern established long in advance. Thus we will go to those places where they may now be engaged in their consecrated task of universal purification. But no more, slave. We go. Out of the Milky Way, the cruiser hurtled at a speed which a sentient light wave would find meaningless. On and on they journeyed in quest of the long-dead Zoz horde. They may still be going. If you're enjoying the story so far, hit the like button to support the channel. Thanks. One Small Step by Haldane B. Doyle Narrated by William Skye Professor Leakey stared out the window of the rover, transfixed by the branching orange lichens, cushions of spiky moss, and mysterious pinprick tracks dotting the mud. Long hours since they arrived at the surface hadn't diminished her wonder at the diverse life forms in this strange and hostile environment. Before this mission, her fellow scientists only had fragments of surface life to study, whatever happened to Wash and Dereach. Those specimens were highly degraded, leaving too much room for speculation. Yet now she was here, on the first exploratory mission, with a sheet of glass between her unblinking eyes and the sprawling ecosystem. She risked distracting Sergeant Finbold at the controls. You must be tired of me saying it, but it's remarkable any organisms can live up here. Harsh radiation, dehydration, the full force of gravity to contend with. It's hard to believe it might all be descended from corresponding organisms in the sea. Piffle, grumbled Finbold, trunk firmly gripping the steering lever. You spawnheads will dream up anything to spice up your next speaking tour. This mission is serious business. Once our technology improves, we can claim the landscape for ourselves. Think of the opportunities. No more making room for cephalopods and mantis shrimps. It was true most of the funding to construct the rover had come from the real estate industry. But the research institutions had been key to getting the rover to work. Just the biopolymers to make a strong enough lifeline cable was a minor miracle. A fresh pulse of oxygen-rich water flushed the cabin to power the peristaltic feet throbbing below. An electrified message pulsed down the communicator, so Leaky rested her trunk on the terminal to detect the signal over the background hum. Status report, Leaky. It was Admiral Houston. Returning to base, Admiral. Estimated arrival a little after sunset. Request permission to try the waterlock for sample collection. Denied. I won't tolerate the risk. The mechanism worked fine in the lab. Don't question my authority. Return to base without delay. Professor Leakey floated to the front of the cramped rover and relayed the brief. From high above Fimbold's head, the larger forward window gave a clear view of the delicate track she had spotted on the journey out. One set of muddy pinpricks ran up and over the lifeline cable. Whatever mysterious creature made them had to be close. Shuffling to the side window, she looked out across the pads of lichen and spotted it. Shining black segments with glowing red legs, a little longer than her trunk. Most importantly, it was moving slower than the rover. Hard left, called Leaky. There's a land animal within reach. Please, Finbolt, you have to let me collect it. What? You have no idea if it's dangerous. An Admiral Houston said, We need results to excite the research community. Don't you want more technology to support colonization? Damn it, it's getting away. Finbold pulled back on the steering lever and stopped the vehicle without further acknowledgement. After pausing for a moment, he steered the lumbering machine up and over a bank of moss. Look at all those feet. Almost a hundred of them. I could name it Hectopeda. Why not exaggerate properly and go for Millipeda? Professor Leakey wished she could name the species Leakeyi to cement her reputation, but that would be embarrassingly egotistical. Look, Finbold, it curled up. Not like a polychaete worm at all. Easy to get in a sample bottle. Just a little closer. And stop. Good. I'm not getting closer to that drop-off. You know how unforgiving gravity is up here. And if it bites your trunk off, you'll get no sympathy from me. Through the side window, the spiralled landworm nestled on a cushion of moss on the edge of an eroded cliff. 
Leaky ran through the steps to operate the water lock several times, just as the engineers had shown her, convincing herself the creature had to be a harmless herbivore. When the final seal released, the pressure in the cabin noticeably dropped. Leaky extended her trunk outside, pushing closer to the opening to block the water escaping, stretching a few more millimetres. The rim of her trunk slipped and slipped again on the waxy carapace of the creature. She was so close she could feel the electrical impulses rippling beneath its exoskeleton, but she couldn't get a grip. Pulling back a little to change her position, a torrent of water poured out from the opening. Below the waterlock the stream was steadily eating away at the sandy bank. The rover tilted noticeably. That's it! exclaimed Fimbold. No more messing around. Seal that up so we can build pressure and get out of here. Leaky tightened her swim bladder and sank a little, then did as instructed. Except the mechanism wouldn't lock together as the engineers had shown her. In a panic she wrenched the waterlock back and forth, but the seal wouldn't realign. Meanwhile water continued to pour out, eating at the bank and tilting the rover even more. She was about to suggest jamming herself against the opening to seal it and limp home when the bank gave away entirely. The rover tumbled on its side several times, the gurgling water and rippling air bubbles swirling around them. It came to a stop, upside down, front window buried in the dirt. Finbold had sprained his trunk hanging onto the controls. Now we've done it. All this for a damn landworm, he grumbled. Leaky ignored him and activated the communicator. Houston, Admiral Houston, we seem to have a slight problem. But there was no response. Pressure is zero, reported Finbold. Lifeline probably snapped. The sun streaming through the side window reminded them of the inhospitable world between them and home. The searing radiation, unbreathable atmosphere, overpowering gravity. Finbold, the oxygen in here will only last an hour or so. Do you think they might send out the prototype rover to retrieve us? They would never reach us in time. This was my fault. I never should. Cut that out. It was my decision, too. The two floated in silence a moment until Leaky remembered the step to seal the water lock. Neither said anything for quite some time as they listened to the rover groan as it sank deeper into the sand. Finbold, do you really think we can live up here? Permanently? That it could ever be safe? Ha! You're the egghead. I thought your sort jumped at any excuse for more gizmos and tech. It's funny. The more you work with technology, the more you realise how unreliable it can be. As if to answer, the rover emitted a run of strangled gurgling, then, satisfied that its contribution, fell silent once more. Hey, Leaky, if we die up here, do you think they'll remember us as heroes or fools? Instead of answering, she swam upwards to the hatch in the floor and started activating the mechanism. With only one of us inside, it doubles the oxygen left. More time for a shot at rescue. And it was my fault. I wanted to see the land life up close. Now I get my wish. If only I could have shared my findings with my colleagues. She had hoped he would say something to comfort her, persuade her to risk staying but he merely watched with his unblinking eyes. If he survived, he would be the hero, and she would be the fool. If you make it home, Finbold, make sure they name that landworm after me. Before he could reply, with a flick of her tail, she propelled herself over the edge of the hatch and rolled down into the moss. She had trained for brief excursions out of water. Because of that, the tense film of moisture clinging to the slime on her eyes was not entirely unfamiliar. Her gills stung and her heart hungered for oxygen, but she convinced herself it would pass. She had even been trained to avoid looking directly into the unfiltered light of the sun, but she did look, just for a moment, at its unforgiving brilliance. After a moment, none of these notions could force their way to the front of her awareness. Instead, the peculiar prickly texture of the pads of moss against her trunk fascinated her. There was no way such an organism could be descended from the flimsy chlorified algae that struggled to secure territory along the coastlines. And that landworm, it was nothing like a sediment-burrowing polychaete. No living thing could change that much. Next, those evolutionists would propose that fish could grow legs and conquer the land without any technology, if only they had the patience to wait long enough. No, the land life must have originated somewhere else, somewhere deep inside the barren heart of the continent. Soon her people would perfect their rovers and land suits and go find them. She only wished she could have seen it for herself. As her vision dimmed and the sun stung her exposed flesh, Professor Leakey praised the unstoppable march of technology. Soon her people would tame this inhospitable world with their ingenuity. Soon the elephant fish would rise to greatness. Cultural Exchange by Keith Laumer Narrated by William Skye
It was a simple student exchange, but Retief gave them more of an education than they expected. Part 1 Second Secretary Magnan took his green-lined cape and orange-feathered beret from the clothes tree. I'm off now, Retief, he said. I hope you'll manage the administrative routine during my absence without any unfortunate incidents. That seems a modest enough hope, Retief said. I'll try to live up to it. I don't appreciate frivolity with reference to this division, Magnan said testily. When I first came here, the Manpower Utilization Directorate, Division of Libraries and Education, was a shambles. I fancy I've made muddle what it is today. Frankly, I question the wisdom of placing you in charge of such a sensitive desk, even for two weeks. But remember, yours is purely a rubber stamp function. In that case, let's leave it to Miss Ferkel. I'll take a couple of weeks off myself. With her poundage, she could bring plenty of pressure to bear. I assume you jest, Retief, Magdalene said sadly. I should expect even you to appreciate that Bogan participation in the exchange program may be the first step towards sublimation of their aggressions into more cultivated channels. I see they're sending 2,000 students to Deland, Retief said, glancing at the memo for record. That's a sizable sublimation. Magnan nodded. The Bogans have launched no less than four military campaigns in the last two decades. They're known as the hoodlums of the Nicodemian Cluster. Now, perhaps we shall see them breaking that precedent and entering into the cultural life of the galaxy. Breaking and entering, Retief said. You may have something there. But I'm wondering what they'll study on Deland. That's an industrial world of the poor but honest variety. Academic details are the affair of the students and their professors, Magnan said. Our function is merely to bring them together. See that you don't antagonize the Bogan representative. This will be an excellent opportunity for you to practice your diplomatic restraint. Not your strong point, I'm sure you'll agree. A buzzer sounded. Retief punched a button. What is it, Miss Ferkel? That bucolic person from Lovenbroy is here again. On the small desk screen, Miss Ferkel's meaty features were compressed in disapproval. This fellow's a confounded pest. I'll leave him to you, Retief, Magdalene said. Tell him something, get rid of him. And remember, here at Core HQ, all eyes are upon you. If I'd have thought of that, I'd have worn my other suit, Retief said. Magnan snorted and passed from view. Retief punched Miss Ferkel's button. Send the bucolic person in. A tall, broad man with bronze skin and grey hair wearing tight trousers of heavy cloth, a loose shirt open at the neck and a short jacket stepped into the room. He had a bundle under his arm. He paused at sight of Retief, looked him over momentarily, then advanced and held out his hand. Retief took it. For a moment the two big men stood face to face. The newcomer's jaw muscles knotted. Then he winced. Retief dropped his hand and motioned to a chair. "'That's nice knuckle work, mister,' the stranger said, massaging his hand. First time anybody ever did that to me. My fault, though. I started it, I guess.' He grinned and sat down. "'What can I do for you?' Retief said. "'You work for this culture bunch, do you? Funny. I thought they were all ribbon-counter boys. Never mind.' I'm Hank Arapoulos. I'm a farmer. What I wanted to see you about was... He shifted in his chair. Well, out on Lovenbroy, we've got a serious problem. The wine crop is just about ready. We start picking in another two, three months. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with the Bacchus vines we grow. No, Retief said. Have a cigar? He pushed a box across the desk. Arapoulos took one. Bacchus vines are an unusual crop, he said, puffing the cigar alight. Only mature every twelve years. In between, the vines don't need a lot of attention, so our time's mostly our own. We like to farm, though. Spend a lot of time developing new forms. Apples the size of a melon and sweet. Sounds very pleasant, Retief said. Where does the libraries and education division come in? Arapoulos leaned forward. We go in pretty heavy for the arts. Folks can't spend all their time hybridising plants. We've turned all the land area we've got into parks and farms. Of course, we left some sizable forest areas for hunting and such. Love and Broy's a nice place, Mr. Retief. It sounds like it, Mr. Arapoulos. Just what? Call me Ank. We've got long seasons back home, five of them. Our year's about eighteen terry months. Cold as hell in winter. Eccentric orbit, you know. Blue black sky, stars visible all day. We do mostly painting and sculpture in the winter. Then spring, still plenty cold. Lots of skiing, bobsledding, ice skating, and it's the season for woodworkers. Our furniture, I've seen some of your furniture, Retief said. Beautiful work. Arapoulos nodded. All local timbers, too. Lots of metals in our soil, and those sulfates give the wood some colour, I'll tell you. In comes the monsoon. Rain, it comes down in sheets. But the sun's getting closer. Shines all the time. 
Ever seen it pouring rain in the sunshine? That's the music writing season. Then summer. Summer's hot. We stay inside in the daytime and have beach parties all night. Lots of beach on Love and Broy. We're mostly islands. That's the drama and symphony time. The theatres are set up on the sand or anchored offshore. You have the music and the surf and the bonfires and stars. We're close to the centre of a globular cluster, you know. You say it's time now for the wine crop? That's right. Autumn's our harvest season. Most years we just have the ordinary crops. Fruit, grain, that kind of thing. Getting it in doesn't take long. We spend most of the time on architecture, getting new places ready for the winter or remodelling the older ones. We spend a lot of time in our houses. We like to have them comfortable. But this year's different. This is wine year. Arapoulos puffed on his cigar, looked worriedly at Retief. Our wine crop is our big money crop, he said. We make enough to keep us going. But this year, the crop isn't panning out? Oh, the crop's fine. One of the best I can remember. Of course, I'm only 28. I can't remember but two other harvests. The problem's not the crop. Have you lost your markets? That sounds like a matter for the commercial. Lost our markets? Mister, nobody that ever tasted our wines ever settled for anything else. It sounds like I've been missing something, said Retief. I'll have to try them sometime. Arapoulos put his bundle on the desk, pulled off the wrappings. No time like the present, he said. Retief looked at the two squat bottles, one green, one amber, both dusty with faded labels and blackened corks secured by wire. Drinking on duty is frowned on in the corps, Mr. Arapoulos, he said. This isn't drinking. It's just wine. Arapoulos pulled the wire retainer loose, thumbed the cork. It rose slowly, then popped in the air. Arapoulos caught it. Aromatic fumes wafted from the bottle. Besides, my feelings would be hurt if you didn't join me, he winked. Retief took two thin-walled glasses from a table beside the desk. Come to think of it, we also have to be careful about violating quaint native customs. Arapoulos filled the glasses. Retief picked one up, sniffed the deep rust-coloured fluid, tasted it, then took a healthy swallow. He looked at Arapoulos thoughtfully. Hmm, it tastes like salted pecans, with an undercurrent of crusted port. Don't try to describe it, Mr. Retief, Arapoulos said. He took a mouthful of wine, swished it around his teeth, swallowed. It's Bacchus wine, that's all. Nothing like it in the galaxy. He pushed the second bottle toward Retief. The custom back home is to alternate red wine and black. Retief put aside his cigar, pulled the wires loose, nudged the cork, caught it as it popped up. Bad luck if you miss the cork, Arapoulos said, nodding. You probably never heard about the trouble we had on Love and Broy a few years back. Can't say that I did, Hank. Retief poured the black wine into two fresh glasses. Here's to the harvest. We've got plenty of minerals on Love and Broy, Arapoulos said, swallowing wine. But we don't plan to wreck the landscape mining them. We like to farm. About ten years back, some neighbours of ours landed a force. They figured they knew better what to do with our minerals than we did. Wanted to strip mine, smelt ore. We convinced him otherwise, but it took a year and we lost a lot of men. That's too bad, Retief said. I'd say this one tastes more like roast beef and popcorn over a Riesling base. It put us in a bad spot, Arapoulos went on. We had to borrow money from a world called Crony, mortgaged our crops. Had to start exporting artwork too. Plenty of buyers, but it's not the same when you're doing it for strangers. Say, this business of alternating drinks is the real McCoy, Retief said. What's the problem? Crony about to foreclose? Well, the loan's due. The wine crop would put us in the clear, but we need harvest hands. Picking back of scrapes isn't a job you can turn over to machinery, and anyway, we wouldn't if we could. Vintage season is the high point of living on Love and Broy. Everybody joins in. First, there's the picking in the fields, miles and miles of vineyards covering the mountainsides, and crowding the riverbanks with gardens here and there. Big vines eight feet high, loaded with fruit and deep grass growing between. The wine carriers keep on the run, bringing wine to the pickers. There's prizes for the biggest day's output, bets on who can fill the most baskets in an hour. The sun's high and bright, and it's just cool enough to give you plenty of energy. Come nightfall, the tables are set up in the garden plots, and the feast is laid on. Roast turkeys, beef, hams, all kinds of fowl. Big salads, plenty of fruit, fresh baked bread, and wine, plenty of wine. The cooking's done by a different crew each night in each garden, and there's prizes for the best crews. Then the wine-making. We still tramp out the vintage. That's mostly for the young folks, but anybody's welcome. That's when things start to get loosened up. Matter of fact, pretty near half our young'uns are born after a vintage. All bets are off, then. It keeps a fellow on his toes, though. Ever tried to hold on to a gal wearing nothing but a layer of grape juice? Never did, Retief said. You say most of the children are born after a vintage. That would make them only twelve years old by the time. Oh, that's love and broy years. They'd be eighteen, Terry reckoning. 
I was thinking you looked a little mature for 28, Retief said. 42, Terry years, Arapulos said. But this year it looks bad. We've got a bumper crop and we're short-handed. If we don't get a big vintage, Crony steps in. Lord knows what they'll do to the land. Then next vintage time, with them holding half our grape acreage. You hocked the vineyards? Yep, pretty dumb, huh? But we figured 12 years was a long time. On the whole, Retief said, I think I prefer the black, but the red is hard to beat. What we figured was maybe you culture boys could help us out, alone to see us through the vintage, enough to hire extra hands. Then we'd repay it in sculpture, painting, furniture. Sorry, Hank. All we do here is work out itineraries for travelling sideshows, that kind of thing. Now, if you needed a troupe of Groaki nose flute players, can they pick grapes? Nope. Anyway, they can't stand the daylight. Have you talked this over with the Labour office? Sure did. They said they'd fix us up with all the electronic specialists and computer programmers we wanted, but no field hands. Said it was what they classified as menial drudgery. You'd have thought I was trying to buy slaves. The buzzer sounded. Miss Ferkel's features appeared on the desk screen. You're due at the Intergroup Council in five minutes, she said. Then afterwards there are the Bogan students to meet. Thanks, Retief finished his glass, stood. I have to run, Hank, he said. Let me think this over. Maybe I can come up with something. Check with me day after tomorrow. And you'd better leave the bottles here. Cultural exhibits, you know. Part 2 As the council meeting broke up, Retief caught the eye of a colleague across the table. Mr Waffle, you mentioned a shipment going to a place called Crony. What are they getting? Waffle blinked. You're the fellow who's filling in for Magnan over at Muddle, he said. Properly speaking, equipment grants are the sole concern of the Motorised Equipment Depot, Division of Loans and Exchanges, he pursed his lips. However, I suppose there's no harm in telling you. They'll be receiving heavy mining equipment. Drill rigs, that sort of thing? Strip mining gear, Waffle took a slip of paper from a breast pocket, blinked at it. Bolo model WV1 tractors, to be specific. Why is Muddle interested in medals activities? Forgive my curiosity, Mr. Waffle. It's just that Crony cropped up earlier today. It seems she holds a mortgage on some vineyards over on. That's not medals affair, sir, Waffle cut in. I have sufficient problems as chief of medal without probing into Muddle's business. Speaking of tractors, another man put in, we over at the Special Committee for Rehabilitation and Overhaul of Underdeveloped Nations General Economies have been trying for months to get a request for mining equipment for Deland through Medal. Scrounge was late on the scene, Waffle said. First come, first served. That's our policy at Medal. Good day, gentlemen. He strode off briefcase under his arm. That's the trouble with peaceful worlds, the Scrounge committee man said. Bogue is a troublemaker, so every agency in the Corps is out to pacify her. Well, my chance to make a record, that is assist peace-loving Deland, comes to naught. He shook his head. What kind of university do they have on Deland? asked Retief. We're sending them 2,000 exchange students. It must be quite an institution. University? Deland has one under-endowed technical college. Will all the exchange students be studying at the technical college? 2,000 students? Ha! 200 students would overtax the facilities of the college. I wonder if the Bogans know that. The Bogans? Why, most of Deland's difficulties are due to the unwise trade agreement she entered into with Bogue. Two thousand students indeed, he snorted and walked away. Retief stopped by the office to pick up a short cape, then rode the elevator to the roof of the 230-storey core HQ building and hailed a cab to the port. The Bogan students had arrived early. Retief saw them lined up on the ramp waiting to go through customs. It would be half an hour before they were cleared through. He turned into the bar and ordered a beer. A tall young fellow on the next stool raised his glass. Happy days, he said. And nights to match. You said it, he gulped half his beer. My name's Cash, Mr. Cash. Yep, Mr. Cash. Boy, this is a drag sitting around this place waiting. You meeting somebody? Yeah, bunch of babies, kids. How they expect? Never mind, have one on me. Thanks. You a scoutmaster? I'll tell you what I am. I'm a cradle robber. You know, he turned to Retief, not one of those kids is over eighteen, he hiccuped. Students, you know. Never saw a student with a beard, did you? Lots of times. You're meeting the students, are you? The young fellow blinked at Retief. Oh, you know about it, huh? I represent Muddle. Karsh finished his beer, ordered another. I came on ahead, sort of an advance guard for the kids. I trained them myself. Treated it like a game, but they can handle a CSU. Don't know how they'll act under pressure. If I had my old platoon, he looked at his beer glass, pushed it back. Had enough, he said. 
So long, friend. Or are you coming along? Retief nodded. Might as well. At the exit to the customs enclosure, Retief watched as the first of the Bogan students came through, caught sight of Karsh and snapped to attention, his chest out. Drop that, mister, Karsh snapped. Is that any way for a student to act? The youth, a round-faced lad with broad shoulders, grinned. Heck no, he said. Say, uh, Mr. Karsh, are we going to get to go to town? We fellows were thinking. You are, huh? You act like a bunch of school kids. I mean, no. Now line up. We have quarters ready for the students, Retief said. If you'd like to bring them around to the west side, I have a couple of copters laid on. Thanks, said Karsh. They'll stay here until take-off time. Can't have the little dears wandering around loose. Might get ideas about going over the hill, he hiccuped. I mean, they might play hooky. We've scheduled your re-embarkation for noon tomorrow. That's a long wait. Muddles arranged theatre tickets and a dinner. Sorry, Karsh said. As soon as the baggage gets here, we're off, he hiccuped again. Can't travel without our baggage, you know. Suit yourself, Retief said. Where's the baggage now? Coming in aboard a crony lighter. Maybe you'd like to arrange for a meal for the students here. Sure, Karsh said. That's a good idea. Why don't you join us? Karsh winked. And bring a few beers. Not this time, Retief said. He watched the students still emerging from customs. They seem to be all boys, he commented. No female students? Maybe later, Karsh said. You know, after we see how the first bunch is received. Back at the muddle office, Retief buzzed Miss Ferkel. Do you know the name of the institution these Bogan students are bound for? Why, the University of Deland, of course. Would that be the technical college? Miss Ferkel's mouth puckered. I'm sure I've never pried into these details. Where does doing your job stop and prying begin, Miss Ferkel? Retief said. Personally, I'm curious as to just what it is these students are travelling so far to study, at core expense. Mr. Magnan never. For the present, Miss Ferkel, Mr. Magnan is vacationing. That leaves me with the question of 2,000 young male students headed for a world with no classrooms for them, a world in need of tractors. But the tractors are on their way to Crony, a world under obligation to Bogue. And Crony holds a mortgage on the best grape acreage on Lovenbroy. Well, Miss Ferkel snapped, small eyes glaring under unplucked brows. I hope you're not questioning Mr. Magnan's wisdom. About Mr. Magnan's wisdom there can be no question, Retief said. But never mind. I'd like you to look up an item for me. How many tractors will Crony be getting under the medal programme? Why, that's entirely medal business, Miss Ferkel said. Mr. Magnan always... I'm sure he did. Let me know about the tractors as soon as you can. Miss Ferkel sniffed and disappeared from the screen. Retief left the office, descended forty-one stories, followed a corridor to the core library. In the stacks he thumbed through catalogues, pored over indices. Can I help you? Someone chirped. A tiny librarian stood at his elbow. Thank you, ma'am, Retief said. I'm looking for information on a mining rig, a Bolo Model WV tractor. You won't find it in the industrial section, the librarian said. Come along. Retief followed her along the stacks to a well-lit section lettered armaments. She took a tape from the shelf, plugged it into the viewer, flipped through and stopped at a squat armoured vehicle. That's the Model WV, she said. It's what is known as a Continental Siege Unit. It carries four men with a half megaton per second firepower. There must be an error somewhere, Retief said. The Bolo model I want is a tractor. Model WV M1. Oh, the modification was the addition of a bulldozer blade for demolition work. That must be what confused you. Probably, among other things. Thank you. Miss Ferkel was waiting at the office. I have the information you wanted, she said. I've had it for over ten minutes. I was under the impression you needed it urgently, and I went to great lengths. Sure, Retief said. Shoot, how many tractors? Five hundred. Are you sure? Miss Ferkel's chins quivered. Well, if you feel I'm incompetent, just questioning the possibility of a mistake, Miss Ferkel. Five hundred tractors is a lot of equipment. Was there anything further? Miss Ferkel inquired frigidly. I sincerely hope not, Retief said. Part 3 Leaning back in Magnan's padded chair with power swivel and hippomatic concontour, Retief leafed through a folder labelled CERP 7602BA Crony General. He paused at a page headed Industry. Still reading, he opened the desk drawer, took out the two bottles of Bacchus wine and two glasses. He poured an inch of wine into each and sipped the black wine meditatively. It would be a pity, he reflected, if anything should interfere with the production of such vintages. Half an hour later, he laid the folder aside, keyed the phone and put through a call to the crony legation. He asked for the commercial attaché. Retief here, Core HQ, he said airily. About the medal shipment, the tractors. 
I'm wondering if there's been a slip-up. My records show we're shipping 500 units. That's correct, 500. Retief waited. Ah, uh, are you there, Retief? I'm still here, and I'm still wondering about the 500 tractors. It's perfectly in order. I thought it was all settled. Mr. Waffle, one unit would require a good-sized plant to handle its output, Retief said. Now Crony subsists on her fisheries. She has perhaps half a dozen pint-sized processing plants. Maybe in a bind they could handle the ore ten WVs could scrape up, if Crony had any ore. It doesn't. By the way, isn't a WV a poor choice as a mining outfit? I should think. See here, Retief, why all this interest in a few surplus tractors? And in any event, what business is it of yours how we plan to use the equipment? That's an internal affair of my government. Mr. Waffle, I'm not Mr. Waffle. What are you going to do with the other 490 tractors? I understood the grant was to be with no strings attached. I know it's bad manners to ask questions. It's an old diplomatic tradition that any time you can get anybody to accept anything as a gift, you've scored points in the game. But if Crony has some scheme cooking... Nothing like that, Retief. It's a mere business transaction. What kind of business do you do with a Bolo WV? With or without a blade attached, it's what's known as a Continental Siege Unit. Great heavens, Retief, don't jump to conclusions. Would you have us branded as warmongers? Frankly, is this a closed line? Certainly, you may speak freely. The tractors are for transshipment. We've gotten ourselves into a difficult situation, balance of payments-wise. This is an accommodation to a group with which we have rather strong business ties. I understand you hold a mortgage on the best land on Lovenbroy, Retief said. Any connection? Why, uh, no. Of course not. <laughs> Who gets the tractors eventually? Retief, this is unwarranted interference. Who gets them? They happen to be going to Lovenbroy, but I scarcely see... And who's the friend you're helping out with an unauthorized transshipment of grant material? Why, uh, I've been working with a Mr. Gulver, a Bogan representative. And when will they be shipped? Why, they went out a week ago. They'll be halfway there by now. But look here, Retief, this isn't what you're thinking. How do you know what I'm thinking? I don't know myself. Retief rang off, buzzed the secretary. Miss Ferkel, I'd like to be notified immediately of any new applications that might come in from the Bogan consulate for placement of students. Well, it happens, by coincidence, that I have an application here now. Mr. Gulver of the consulate brought it in. Is Mr. Gulver in the office? I'd like to see him. I'll ask him if he has time. Great, thanks. It was half a minute before a thick-necked, red-faced man in a tight hat walked in. He wore an old-fashioned suit, a drab shirt, shiny shoes with round toes, and an ill-tempered expression. What is it you wish? he barked. I understood in my discussions with the other, uh, civilian, there'd be no further need for these irritating conferences. I've just learned you're placing more students abroad, Mr. Gulver. How many this time? Two thousand. And where will they be going? Crony. It's all in the application form I've handed in. Your job is to provide transportation. Will there be any other students embarking this season? Why, perhaps. That's Bogue's business. Gulver looked at Retief with pursed lips. As a matter of fact, we had in mind dispatching another 2,000 to Featherweight. Another underpopulated world, and in the same cluster, I believe, Retief said. Your people must be unusually interested in that region of space. If that's all you wanted to know, I'll be on my way. I have matters of importance to see to. After Gulver left, Retief called Miss Ferkelin. I'd like to have a break out of all the student movements that have been planned under the present programme, he said and see if you can get a summary of what Medal has been shipping lately. Miss Ferkel compressed her lips. If Mr. Magnan were here, I'm sure he wouldn't dream of interfering in the work of other departments. I overheard your conversation with the gentleman from the crony legation. The lists, Miss Ferkel. I'm not accustomed, Miss Ferkel said, to intruding in matters outside our interest cluster. That's worse than listening in on phone conversations, eh? But never mind. I need the information, Miss Ferkel. Loyalty to my chief, loyalty to your paycheck should send you scuttling for the material I've asked for, Retief said. I'm taking full responsibility. Now scat. The buzzer sounded. Retief flipped a key. Muddle, Retief speaking. Arapoulos's brown face appeared on the desk screen. How do, Retief? Okay if I come up? Sure, Hank. I want to talk to you. In the office, Arapoulos took a chair. Sorry if I'm rushing you, Retief, he said. But have you got anything for me? Retief waved at the wine bottles. What do you know about Crony? Crony? Not much of a place. Mostly ocean. All right, if you like fish, I guess. We import our seafood from there. Nice prawns in monsoon time. Over a foot long. You on good terms with them? Sure, I guess so. Of course, they're pretty thick with Bogue. 
So? Didn't I tell you? Bogue was the bunch that tried to take us over here a dozen years back. They'd have made it too if they hadn't had a lot of bad luck. Their armour went in the drink, and without armour, they're easy game. Miss Ferkle buzzed. I have your lists, she said shortly. Bring them in, please. The secretary placed the papers on the desk. Arapoulos caught her eye and grinned. She sniffed and marched from the room. What that gal needs is a slippery time in the Great Mash, Arapoulos observed. Retief thumbed through the papers, pausing to read from time to time. He finished and looked at Arapoulos. How many men do you need for the harvest, Hank? Retief inquired. Arapoulos sniffed his wine glass and looked thoughtful. A hundred would help, he said. A thousand would be better. Cheers. What would you say to two thousand? Two thousand? Retief, you're not fooling. I hope not. He picked up the phone, called the Port Authority, asked for the dispatch clerk. Hello, Jim. Say, I have a favour to ask of you. You know that contingent of Bogan students? They're travelling aboard the two CDT transports. I'm interested in the baggage that goes with the students. Has it arrived yet? OK, I'll wait. Jim came back to the phone. Yeah, Retief, it's here. Just arrived. But there's a funny thing. It's not consigned to Deland. It's ticketed clear through to Lovenbroy. Listen, Jim, Retief said. I want you to go over to the warehouse and take a look at that baggage for me. Retief waited while the dispatch clerk carried out the errand. The level in the two bottles had gone down an inch when Jim returned to the phone. Hey, I took a look at that baggage, Retief. Something funny going on. Guns, two millimetre needlers, Mark 12 hand blasters, power pistols. It's okay, Jim, nothing to worry about, just a mix-up. Now, Jim, I'm going to ask you to do something more for me. I'm covering for a friend. It seems he slipped up. I wouldn't want word to get out, you understand. I'll send along a written change order in the morning that will cover you officially. Meanwhile, here's what I want you to do. Retief gave instructions, then rang off and turned to Arapoulos. As soon as I get off a couple of TWXs, I think we'd better get down to the port, Hank. I think I'd like to see the students off personally. Part 4 Karsh met Retief as he entered the departures enclosure at the port. What's going on here? he demanded. There's some funny business with my baggage consignment. They won't let me see it. I've got a feeling it's not being loaded. You'd better hurry, Mr. Karsh, Retief said. You're scheduled to blast off in less than an hour. Are the students all loaded? Yes, blast you. What about my baggage? Those vessels aren't moving without it. No need to get so upset about a few toothbrushes, is there, Mr. Karsh? Retief said blandly. Still, if you're worried, he turned to Arapoulos. Hank, why don't you walk Mr. Karsh over to the warehouse and, uh, take care of him? I know just how to handle it, Arapoulos said. The dispatch clerk came up to Retief. I caught the tractor equipment, he said. Funny kind of mistake, but it's okay now. They're being offloaded at Deland. I talked to the traffic controller there. He said they weren't looking for any students. The labels got switched, Jim. The students go where the baggage was consigned. Too bad about the mistake, but the armaments office will have a man along in a little while to dispose of the guns. Keep an eye out for the luggage. No telling where it's got to. Here! A hoarse voice yelled. Retief turned. A dishevelled figure in a tight hat was crossing the enclosure, arms waving. Hi there, Mr. Gulver, Retief called. How's Bogue's business coming along? Piracy! Gulver blurted as he came up to Retief, puffing hard. You've got a hand in this, I don't doubt. Where's that Magnum fellow? What seems to be the problem? Retief said. Hold those transports. I've just been notified that the baggage shipment has been impounded. I'll remind you that shipment enjoys diplomatic free entry. Who told you it was impounded? Never mind, I have my sources. Two tall men buttoned into grey tunics came up. Are you Mr. Retief of CDT? One said. That's right. What about my baggage? Gulver cut in. And I'm warning you, if those ships lift without... These gentlemen are from the Armaments Control Commission, Retief said. Would you like to come along and claim your baggage, Mr. Gulver? From where? I... Gulver turned two shades redder about the ears. Armaments? The only shipment I've held up seems to be somebody's arsenal, Retief said. Now, if you claim this is your baggage... Why, impossible, Gulver said in a strained voice. Armaments? Ridiculous. There's been an error. At the baggage warehouse, Gulver looked glumly at the opened cases of guns. No, of course not, he said dully. Not my baggage. Not my baggage at all. Arapoulos appeared, supporting the stumbling figure of Mr. Karsh. What? What's this? Gulver spluttered. Karsh? What happened? He had a little fall. He'll be okay, Arapoulos said. You'd better help him to the ship, Retief said. It's ready to lift. We wouldn't want him to miss it. Leave him to me, 
Gulver snapped, his eyes slashing at Karsh. I'll see he's dealt with. I couldn't think of it, Retief said. He's a guest of the Corps, you know. We'll see him safely aboard. Gulver turned, signalled frantically. Three heavy-set men in identical drab suits detached themselves from the wall, crossed to the group. Take this man, Gulver snapped, indicating Karsh, who looked at him dazedly, reached up to rub his head. We take our hospitality seriously, Retief said. We'll see him aboard the vessel. Gulver opened his mouth. I know you feel bad about finding guns instead of school books in your luggage, Retief said, looking Gulver in the eye. You'll be busy straightening out the details of the mix-up. You'll want to avoid further complications. Uh, oh, yes, Gulver said. He appeared unhappy. Arapulos went on to the passenger conveyor, turned to wave. Your man, he's going too, Gulver blurted. He's not our man, properly speaking, Retief said. He lives on Lovenbroy. Lovenbroy? Gulver choked. But the... I... I know you said the students were bound for Deland, Retief said, but I guess that was just another aspect of the general confusion. The course plugged into the navigators was to Lovenbroy. You'll be glad to know they're still headed there, even without the baggage. Perhaps, Gulver said grimly. Perhaps they'll manage without it. By the way, Retief said, there was another funny mix-up. There were some tractors, for industrial use, you'll recall. I believe you cooperated with Crony in arranging the Grant Three Medal. They were erroneously consigned to Lovenbroy, a purely agricultural world. I saved you some embarrassment, I trust, Mr. Gulver, by arranging to have them offloaded at Deland. Deland? You've put the CSUs in the hands of Bogue's bitterest enemies. But they're only tractors, Mr. Gulver. Peaceful devices. Isn't that correct? That's correct, Gulver sagged. Then he snapped erect. Hold the ships, he yelled. I'm cancelling the student exchange. His voice was drowned by the rumble as the first of the monster transports rose from the launch pit, followed a moment later by the second. Retief watched them out of sight, then turned to Gulver. They're off, he said. Let's hope they get a liberal education. Part 5 Retief lay on his back in deep grass by a stream, eating grapes. A tall figure appeared on the knoll above him and waved. Retief! Hank Arapoulos bounded down the slope and embraced Retief, slapping him on the back. I heard you were here, and I've got news for you. You won the final day's picking competition. Over 200 bushels. That's a record. Let's get on over to the garden. Sounds like the celebration's about to start. In the flower-crowded park among the stripped vines, Retief and Arapoulos made their way to a laden table under the lanterns. A tall girl dressed in loose white and with long golden hair came up to Arapoulos. Delinda, this is Retief, today's winner, and he's also the fellow that got those workers for us. Delinda smiled at Retief. I've heard about you, Mr. Retief. We weren't sure about the boys at first. Two thousand bogans and all confused about their baggage that went astray. But they seem to like the picking. She smiled again. That's not all. Our gals like the boys, Hank said. Even bogans aren't so bad, minus their irons. A lot of them will be staying on. But how come you didn't tell me you were coming, Retief? I'd have laid on some kind of big welcome. I liked the welcome I got, and I didn't have much notice. Mr. Magnan was a little upset when he got back. It seems I exceeded my authority. Arapoulos laughed. I had a feeling you were wheeling pretty free, Retief. I hope you didn't get into any trouble over it. No trouble, Retief said. A few people were a little unhappy with me. It seems I'm not ready for important assignments at departmental level. I was shipped off here to the boondocks to get a little more experience. Delinda, look after Retief, said Arapoulos. I'll see you later. I've got to see to the wine judging. He disappeared in the crowd. Congratulations on winning the day, said Delinda. I noticed you at work. You were wonderful. I'm glad you're going to have the prize. Thanks. I notice you too flitting around in that white nighty of yours. But why weren't you picking grapes with the rest of us? I had a special assignment. Too bad. You should have had a chance at the prize. Delinda took Retief's hand. I wouldn't have anyway, she said. I'm the prize. Remember to hit the like button if you're enjoying the stories. It really helps the channel grow. Thank you. The Trap by Betsy Curtis Narrated by William Skye She had her mind made up. The one way they'd make her young again was over her dead body. Old Miss Barbara Noble twitched aside the edge of the white scrim curtain to get a better look at the young man coming down the street. 
he might be the one. The young man bent a little under the weight of the battered black suitcase as he crossed Maple and started up Prospect on Miss Noble's side. She could see him set the case down on the wide porch of the rainy house and wipe his forehead with a handkerchief. Then she lost sight of him as he advanced to the door. He could be a visitor to the Rainies, but they were out of town on vacation. He could be a salesman. Miss Barbara shifted her rocker to the other side of the window, where she could watch without having to disturb the curtain. This second-floor sitting room made an excellent lookout. She quickly scanned the street in the other direction, but there was no sign of movement in the hot sunlight. She settled down to watch the black suitcase sitting uncommunicatively at the edge of the porch. It must have been all of two minutes before the young man appeared from under the overhanging roof and picked up the case. A persistent fellow. He went down to the sidewalk and approached her own house, came up on her own front doorstep, tried to set the case down on the narrow stoop, couldn't, straightened up, and rang the bell. A raucous buzz filled the sitting room. Barbara Noble leaned toward the window, pulled back the curtain a scant inch, and studied his back as he looked at the windows on the other side of the front door. Limp yellow hair and a big perspiration stain in the middle of a dark sports shirt were her chief impressions. He could be a bona fide salesman working hard at it. She wouldn't let him in, of course, but she felt a little sorry for him lugging that big case around in this weather. Then he turned and looked straight at the window behind which she was hiding, and she let the curtain go suddenly. Had he seen it move? The buzzer sounded again, imperiously. Miss Barbara got up stiffly, moved to the big visor screen in the nearest corner, and switched it on. The man might have something interesting, and she couldn't get out to shop the way she used to. She smoothed her lilac house dress and left the room to descend the stairs to the front door. In the tiny front hall, she hesitated, then opened the door inward about eight inches. Deftly, the man stuck the broad brown toe of his shoe into the opening and looked down at her. She grinned as she saw his expression of shock. She was old, really old. Her sparse white hair was pulled so tightly into a knob on top of her head that the plentiful wrinkles on her forehead and around her eyes seemed to run vertically, giving her an oriental look. The hand she rested on the door jamb was a waxy white claw, a blue vein standing up prominently under the skin tight drawn over gnarly finger joints. He had probably never seen a woman much past middle age. Well, her croak was high and rough. The young man recovered himself and began his spiel. Madame, I represent one of the best known and most reputable firms in the country. Our products have received three international medals for purity and effective performance. They... What are you selling, young man? I have the privilege of being a field representative for Taffeta Beauty Aids. Please, accept this generous ten-ounce bottle of our Diamond Dew Refreshest Lotion. He reached into his side pocket and brought it out, offered it with the most appreciative smile, his You hardly need this smile. Her hand did not reach out. I don't want any. Goodbye. The door tightened against his foot. But madame... His foot did not budge, and his smile became both engaging and pleading. All I ask is a chance to show you our line. Our products sell themselves. Besides, I'm paid on a demonstration basis, so much for every potential customer who receives our free sample, and so much for every home demonstration. You wouldn't want me to lose 250 when it would only take six and a third minutes of your time exactly to look over one of the most amazing displays ever. Well, I don't know... I know you'll enjoy watching our tissue cleanser in action and seeing the new simplicity of our home re- Oops, he'd almost said it. Hair relustrification kit. I promise you that your few minutes won't be wasted. Yours would be, young man. I don't buy that stuff. You may be one of the lucky few women who don't need our products, but I don't think you can say that before you've seen them. I never did see such persistence, honest to goodness. Her face assumed a crabbed smile. Come along, then. She moved back from the door into the darkness of the house, and the salesman shifted his case back to his left hand, pushed the front door wide, and took a quick, long step inside. 
He was just in time to hear the slight click of the closing of a second door in front of him. He reached for the knob, turned it, but the door was locked. The outside door still stood open, caught by the end of the sample case. The July daylight from outside showed him that he was in a tiny entrance hall, not more than forty inches each way. He pulled the case in, and by squeezing against the inner door, allowed the front door to close. Anyhow, he was inside the house. He rapped sharply on the inner door. The latch on the front door snapped to, and instantly the hall was flooded with light from a tremendous bulb in the ceiling, which surprisingly was twenty feet above him. A harsh voice, tinny with tremendous amplification, but unmistakably that of the old woman, filled the hall. All right, young man. I have the visor turned on you. Let's see the demonstration. I believe you said six minutes. Get on with it. Screening his eyes with his fingers, the salesman scanned the walls and ceiling for the visor lens, found it beside the 500-watt bulb pouring blindingly down on him on the other side of a speaker grill. C certainly, madam. What a layout! As he automatically laid his case on the floor and opened back the top against the front door, his eyes searched the walls for indications of openings which might mean unexpected defences, such as anaesthetic tanks. The only breaks in the two smooth white plaster surfaces which he could see as he squatted before the case were a horizontal row of glass bosses on each side at about the height of his knees. Now, since my face, he closed his eyes and flashed a toothy smile, like a video actor, up at the visor lens, is subjected to the daily care of taffeta products, he turned his face down to the case and gritted his teeth, I must smear facial muscle softener into the left half, to show the action and appearance of muscles which have lost their tonus. He whipped the cover off a small ivory jar and rubbed his cheek vigorously with a brownish salve. You will note that this softener also contains a percentage of grime which lodges in the pores. He heard a gasp from the speaker grill when he displayed a face whose left cheek and brow were sagged, wrinkled, and hideously brown speckled. From somewhere behind the gasp, he heard a continuous tinkle of tiny bells. His hands moved among the bottles and jars, raised a round silver box which he held up. The delicately perfumed applicator pads for all applications of taffeta preparations are pre-saturated with thermal tone charger. I dip the pad into this solution of enhancing hyssop, he did so, and work it gently into the pores. The results are instantaneous, he turned up his original video star appearance. While bending his body forward to reach the article strapped to the top of the case, he noticed that the tone of the distant bells was raised. Screwing a circular hairbrush to the thread of a collapsible tube, he sank back on his haunches. The bell tones were lower. He placed a hand on one of the glass bosses nearest the inner door, apparently to steady himself. An even lower tone was added to the bell notes. Obviously electric eyes with a set of bell signals in the old woman's present location. He smiled down at the floor to himself. Now I want you to notice closely this object which I will show you. He held up the brush with the tube screwed on its back and turned it about. Do you know what this is? There was no answer from the speaker but its own hum and the tinkle of the bells. What does it look like? He spoke rapidly, pleasantly. There was still no answer. He rose quickly and tried the knob of the inner door again. He could hear the bell notes lower in pitch as he pressed against the door. Let me see the thing again, young man. Honest to goodness, what difference does it make whether or not I know what it is? It looks like a hairbrush with some do-jigger on the top. He jumped back to the centre of the hall. This brush is the essential feature of our sensational hair relustrifier kit. The tube screwed to the top feeds the specially developed brilliant set directly through each hollow bristle to reach every part of the hair. He ran, or rather scrubbed, the brush through the right side of his long, fair pompadour with small rotary motions. When he removed the brush, that side of his head was covered with crisp yellow ringlets, which shone under the light like sculptured gold. That's some sort of a trick! Do it on the other! Her voice was interrupted by a syncopated clicking. A telephone signal. Just a moment, young man. The hum of the speaker cut off, and the sudden silence seemed full of the echoes of the bells. Instantly, the man dropped the gadget into the case 
and grabbed a handful of cleansing tissues from a box in it. He snapped down the top of the case and whipped the straps through the buckles. Then he shoved the case against one of the side walls and sat on it to flip off his shoes and socks. Shoving his back tightly against the wall, he bent his knees up and pushed his bare feet flat against the other. After placing the wad of tissues in his lap, he put his hands against the wall below his buttocks and, like an experienced mountain climber, inched his way rapidly up the chimney of the hall. When his head touched the ceiling, he braced himself firmly with his left hand and reached with his right for the tissues in his lap. Protecting his hand with several of the white papers, he felt above him for the base of the light bulb, unscrewed it, and dropped it gently onto the rest of the tissue still in his lap. The sudden blackness was smothering. Heat seeped through the tissues more rapidly than he had expected, and the effort to keep his knees from contracting and spilling him in the utter darkness to the floor fifteen feet below was agony. When he finally reached the floor, he placed the bulb on it beside the sample case. Then he opened the front door and closed it again, leaving the door caught open a fraction of an inch by the latch against the frame. Taking an anaesthetic cartridge out of his pants pocket, he broke the seal, taking care not to trigger it, and returned to his crevice-climbing posture. He lifted himself again above the row of electric eyes and waited, cartridge in hand, leg muscles cramping painfully. After Miss Noble had turned off the speakphone, she pulled herself away from the fascinating view of golden curls and scuttled off to a stiff ladder-back chair beside the telephone stand. She lifted the antique cradle phone, none of these modern invasions of privacy like the visor phone, and spoke warily into the mouthpiece. Who is it? What do you want? Barbara, a man's voice was urgent. This is Miss Noble speaking, she replied haughtily. The voice was savage. Well, this is Dr. Harris, then. Have you looked at the mail today? I got my director's meeting notice this morning. Yes, I got one, the 5th of August, she said impatiently. And this seems to be our year. There's been a girl here already this morning with some story about my having advertised for a housekeeper. She told it to the door phone and wouldn't leave when I said I didn't want anybody, but it only took one drop of skunk oil in the hallway to send her packing. The horrid chuckle that came from the receiver was so raucous that Miss Noble held it away from her ear. "'Blonde or brunette?' she asked non-committally. "'Blonde, and really young, not a damn rejuvenee.' "'Rod Harris, you actually went and peeked at her, you old goat!' "'Only through the one way.' "'Well, since the company knows that a pretty girl is still good bait for an old ninny, you're as good as a goner. They'll have you rejuvenated before long.' They won't get a chance to, and I'm going to get old enough so I can't even lift a hand to thumb my nose at the company. Then I'm going to go and die and the Juvine Perpetual Youth Corporation will scream in agony as it disbands and makes public property of its hallowed formulas as per the original articles of incorporation. And you will probably get a new set of false teeth and take the treatment again since you could get it real cheap when the monopoly's finished and not have to disturb your millions salted away in the sugar bowl. This mixture of facetiousness and downright sarcasm was only surpassed by Miss Noble, who snapped back. Don't you sneer at me, Dr. Roland Harris, when you know perfectly well that the only reason I have to go on living this long is to make sure that you are really dead first. You didn't invent rejuvenation all by yourself without the aid of Barbara Noble, PhD, and the company has the sole right to the process until we're both dead. And if you start peeking at plump blonde wenches at this point, I suppose I'll have to live till Los Alamos freezes over. All right, all right. But she wasn't plump. She wasn't any bigger than you are. Besides, you know I'd rather have dinner with you. My man Marco could give us roast beef with all the fixings, and afterward I want you to hear my latest discovery. It's the best damn extempore singer you ever heard. Jeery Wade, fellow in his first late fifties. No fluff brain of a juvenile. A blood-and-thunder baritone that'll lift that knob of hair clean off your scalp. Let's say you get here about 6.30, and I'll phone him we'll be over at his place for a session of hollering about 8. Miss Noble's scorn needed no visor to carry it over the wire in full force. I'm not going to budge out of this house until after the director's meeting, and then only if the shops stop all delivery service. This time I'm not taking any chances. 
Life is too much of a bore to have to put up with it for another 80 years, even for your marvellous singer, who would probably go and get rejuvenated just as I got to enjoy him. And nothing could induce me to listen to an evening of your stories for the 900th time. If there's one thing I'm thankful for in this scatterbrained age, it's the marriage dissolution law that got me free from your anecdotes after three separate terms of fifty years each. Now, Barbara, was it that bad? Roland Harris sounded distressed. Do you really think I could be honestly grateful to the corporation for a hundred and fifty years of listening to that disgraceful old thing about the Martian, the Venusian, and the robot? Well, if you feel that way about it, I'll keep my discoveries to myself. I hope your fancy hallway keeps you safe till you rot. It's doing all right, replied the old woman smugly. I have a young pup down there right now calling his number thirteens and waiting to pretend to interest me in some new face paint and hair gick. My electric eye set and visor are less repulsive than your skunk oil and twice as effective. They're not going to stop me from having a good time while I last, anyhow. I think they're through with me for today, and I'm going to hear Jerry Wade anyhow. He'll make up a hooting good song about all this when I tell him. Take care of yourself, Rod. Goodbye, said Miss Noble, almost concernedly. She dropped the phone into its cradle, rose, and went back to the visor screen, switching on the speaker as she sat down. Only then did she notice that the screen was entirely dark, except for a vague sliver of grey. Are you still there, young man? she asked the microphone. There was silence from the speaker. The hammer on each bar of the long metal xylophone of the electric eye signal hung motionless. He's gone, and left the front door unlatched too, and I thought he was persistent. She was disappointed. He owes me four more minutes of fun. She got up slowly and started for the door. That curly hair stuff is new since my last sixties too. I wonder if it would work on white hair. I'd better go down and close the door. Can't have just anybody coming into one's house. She descended the stairs, opened the door from the front room, then took one step forward into the hall. Before she could interpret the soft bump of the salesman's bare feet as they struck the floor, she was encircled by his strong arm, and the hiss of the anaesthetic gun was loud in the small area of the hall. Limply she sagged against his arm. The hissing of the gun stopped. The young man slipped it into his pocket and, turning, thrust the inner door wide open with his now free hand. Entering the tidy front room, he kicked the door shut behind him and gulped in the good air before he headed for the back of the house, cradling the small body easily in his arms. Failing to find there what he was looking for, he went up the narrow white-railed stairway to the second floor. Across the landing, the gleam of porcelain showed through a half-open door. He laid his burden carefully on the vari-coloured braided rug by the tub, and began to draw a warm bath, testing the temperature frequently with his hand. When water reached the overflow outlet, he turned off the tap and sprinted downstairs for his sample case. The hall was still chokingly full of gas, and after grabbing out the case, he slammed the door again. He brought the case up to the bathroom, where he opened it on the floor beside the form of the old woman. He lifted out the tray, revealing masses of silvery tubing and a number of flasks of iridescent solutions nestling among loops of rubber-insulated wiring. One flask he emptied into the bath, making the water seethe and turn a cloudy green. Then, dashing down the stairs again, he began looking for the telephone. His search became more and more hurried as he opened cupboards and drawers in front room and kitchen with no success. Returning upstairs, he almost missed the instrument in the sitting room, because he was expecting the familiar sight of a round visor screen. He stood over the phone and dialed. Hey, Alice. What luck, Riggy. I'm in. The lady's out cold on the bathroom floor. Primer solutions in the bath at five above tepid. And shoving her in now, with all her clothes on, of course. And I've wasted a lot of time already looking for this hyperblastic phone. So beat it on over here with Margie and get to work. Are you ordering me around, Rigel O'Maffy? You know I never did this job on a woman. And don't forget, honey, we'll get enough out of this to get a new copter together. Come on now. He put the phone back in the cradle before she could answer. Back in the bathroom, he drew a long thermometer from the case, took a careful reading on the water, ran in a little more hot from the faucet, and left it running the slightest dribble. 
Carefully lifting the small body of Barbara Noble, PhD, he slid it gently into the water, feet first over the end, smoothing down with one hand the percale house dress which ballooned as she went into the water. Finally, he knelt beside the tub, holding her head out of the water in the crook of his elbow. A banging on the inner door downstairs some fifteen minutes later reminded him of the force with which he had slammed it in his hurry to reach the uncontaminated air of the front room. He looked longingly across the bathroom at the racks of towels on the other side, but finally, as the banging stopped and a feminine voice began yelling, Hey, Riggy, let us in! He grabbed up the bright rug and wadded it under the scrawny neck. The girls scolded him all the way up the stairs for not leaving the door unlocked, while he tried to explain, at the same time, that he had to hold up the woman's head. Screepers, Riggy, what do you think the perfectly good pair of water wings in your case is for? Humbled, he departed as the girls took over the beginning of the complicated, fortnight-long process of the rejuvenation of Barbara Noble. The receptionist behind the ebony desk, whose gold plate proclaimed it as the headquarters of the Juvine Perpetual Youth Corporation, crammed shut the drawer before her. A metal clink from within was the fall of a mirror with which she had been assisting the application of scarlet which now fluoresced gently on her full lips. Tossing her head, which showed the crop of glistening black curls to the fullest advantage, in a preoccupied manner, she addressed the man who stood before her desk. How can the Juvine Perpetual Youth Corporation serve you? Her hastily assumed look of efficient importance was replaced by melting eagerness as she took in the chiselled perfection of features and the broad shoulders of the young man in knife-creased bronze spunlon. I'm Harris, for the director's meeting. His voice was curt. You're Dr. Harris, the director. Oh, do come in. She rose from the desk and went around the end of it to open the high-wrought gold gate and hold it wide for him. You're a little early. I'll take you down to the boardroom. Eager willingness to help was apparent in her every gesture. Thanks, I know the way, he informed her, brushing past. She followed him, however, across the patio-like reception room, with its exotically gardened borders and splashing fountain down the long corridor past glowing murals of men and women swimming, dancing and playing tennis, past tapestry-shielded doorways to the great bright arch at the end. Before he went through, she caught his sleeve. I should be pleased to steno for you today if you need me. He turned and looked at her as if he had not known she was behind him. Thanks, but I shan't need one. It'll be a short meeting. He smiled down and patted her cheek. But if I'm not entirely satisfied with the proceedings, maybe I can dictate a little afterward. She laughed as if that were a special joke between them, and retreated rapidly down the corridor before he had time to turn and miss the splendour of her graceful carriage. His eyebrows were still raised, and the corners of his mouth curved in appreciation, when he passed through the arch and into the vast room under the clear bubble of a tremendous sky dome. A girl was sitting there her back to him, looking out over the simmering city streets to the cool rise of mountains beyond. He recognised at once the slight figure, the sheen of the long curling auburn bob, the poise of her head and slim hand resting on the arm of the chair. Babs! She turned half around. Hello, Rod! He grinned and sank down in the next chair. Here we are again! Knocked out by your own skunk oil? She asked pointedly. No, company copter man got me leaving Jerry Wade's. What happened to you? I thought you were walled up neatly for the declining years. The cosmetic man ambushed me in the hall, but I've got another fifty years to figure out something better, if I still need it. What do you mean, if you still need it? Are you changing your mind about rejuvenation? She smiled. Well, you know it's always fun at first, but I'm having my lawyer come to this meeting. I've got an idea we can change the Articles of Agreement so that the process can finally become public property at the end of another fifty years, instead of only after our deaths. Then, if we want to go on and die, nobody— She waved her hand around the great room at the little group of athletic men and glamorous, expensively gowned women moving in through the arch. Nobody will have any financial interest in rejuvenating us. Then, too, our own fat incomes will lapse— and since that's the reason we set up the articles the way they are, so we'd never be in danger of starving, that is, 
we'd have the more interesting choice of whether to die off or get young again and go back to work. Would you sign a fifty-year termination, Rod? Would you marry me for the fifty years, perhaps? His voice was gentle, pleading. Honest to goodness now, aren't you really pretty tired of me? She asked earnestly, turning to face him. No, I can't say I am. You're pretty special, Doctor, and you're special pretty. It was a ritual. You know you're the only man. I'll marry you. Will you sign? Of course I'll sign. I would have anyhow when I knew you wanted me to. And Babs, maybe we could get some sort of jobs now. Sort of to get in practice. I'll bet we could rent a lab somewhere and do commercial analyses for a while until we got hit by another idea for research. Rod, that's the best idea you've had in the last hundred and fifty years. But we could have a honeymoon first, couldn't we? That's your best suggestion in the last seventy years. And maybe we could get Jerry Wade and his wife to rejuvenate and go with us. After the first couple of weeks, that is. They left the meeting arm in arm, somewhat ahead of the rather disgruntled group of directors, who stayed behind to lament the end of a good thing. In the garden room, Barbara stopped to choose an orchid. Rod Harris wandered on to the receptionist's desk, where the girl of the black curls waited, smiling. He looked back at Barbara, then smiled down at the girl. Just like I said, a short meeting. No need for any dictating. Lucky you. Oh, I don't know, she countered coyly. Say, I heard a story the other day you might like. Do you like stories? What kind of story? You'd have to be the judge of that. Suddenly, Barbara was with them, pinning on a bronze and green blossom. Come on along, dear. We've got a good many things to do before we leave. He opened the golden wicket for her and followed her out. Turning back toward the desk, he called to the girl. I may be back in a few weeks to see about a job. Remind me then to tell you the one about the Martian, the Venusian, and the robot. Thanks for listening to this compilation. If you want more of these stories, subscribe to the channel where I release read-alongs every Monday and Friday. And consider signing up to my Patreon to get early access to full novel narrations, as well as exclusive stories each month. That's patreon.com forward slash stories from the sky SFF. Staying on YouTube, I have plenty more compilations like this, including five charming and quirky sci-fi short stories. A link to that video is on screen now.